So my name is uh, Brian Nitto, and I'm uh, here to uh, interview Corey Coulter, uh, who I like to consider a good close friend, uh, a comrade, uh, always a guy that's out there in the field kind of challenging and doing some cool things. And so uh, welcome aboard, Corey, uh, to you. this interview, remote interviews that we have to take now uh, for granted. Um, oh. So how are you? I'm a little stir crazy, but... Uh... Yeah, you know, we're hanging in. Like I said, you know, I got three three teenagers. I know you you got some little ones running around. So it's a little bit different when they're teenagers and they can just mope and just be like, I'm bored. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we're doing all right. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my thing, is that I got two little ones. I got a three year old and a five year old and uh it's it's chaos. It's uh, wearing a lot of hats and uh kind of trying to uh manage a little bit of like sanity in the mix you know all of a sudden you're a teacher educator uh, at home and you know committing certain time frames where like you're used to a certain routine and it's like yeah just throw it out the window <laughs> like, well but yeah you also have the added benefit of having a home barber school you gotta talk yeah. you gotta show that yeah that yeah I, <laughs> okay well well on that note here here we're gonna we're gonna give you this the this profile right now and then what i'm going to do is give you the oh the oh this gorgeous close, yeah mm. it's it's bad i mean there's a lot of damage that was done this round um i mean if i go over to another area you can see just it, it gets higher and oh. and it's it's hideous dude <laughs> is that ben is ben doing that too it's ben. that was all ben mm. i i you know i have to say like um my grandfather was a barber and i thought maybe the traits you know came through the genetics and down the tree and no it hasn't it really it stopped it stopped cold yeah. turkey with ben it it um it's not going it's not going to happen he's not he's not one to be creative he's more like our our, our bam bam you know he's uh yeah he's he constantly is. um into things and breaking things he's just, you know a man a, a, a child of brute force well i got a feeling you know my oldest he's already he's had a beard well he's a senior now but he's had a beard his entire high school career and now i've got a 14 year old you know son running up the ranks and he's using quarantine to stop shaving as well so i might have you know three wookies coming out of this but what's the, what's the thing like that you've kind of given up on i mean i'm almost at a point where i'm like if i'm not leaving the house i don't have to wear shoes i'm not wearing socks so i've been barefoot and I've almost thought about like I don't think I've worn deodorant. Is that a, is that a bad oh thing? Oh my god, no, that's terrible. That's terrible. The only thing I've given up on is life. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm like. I don't I don't really change my habits that much, but I'm like I've been barefoot a lot more. Let's get into a little bit about your background. How did it all get started? How did it all of a sudden just like kind of mesh? Well. In order for everything to mesh, you know, when I first started, I entered the paddock in uh, the end of 2011. So 2012 was my first year. And, you know, I had just gotten out of aerospace. We had just gone through some pretty big layoffs. And um, some people may or may not remember him, but Tim Saunders was the guy who owned uh, the Corona Honda team. And uh, when the road race factory was forming, Danny Walker needed a trailer. So Tim had a trailer to, that needed uh, to, to go away to be used. And uh, I came with the trailer. So I ended up at the road race factory as the trailer mechanic, but I had always been doing photography since high school. I'd always been doing, you know, kind of PR related stuff. Even in aerospace, I was doing those types of activities. So once I got into the, the paddock and with road race factory, I was just like, man, you guys don't, why isn't the press showing up? Why don't you guys have, you know, a Facebook page? Why don't you guys have all this other stuff? So I started, you know, using my cameras, which at the time were, were pretty crappy. I mean, it was entry level, uh, you know, DSLR type stuff because we still hadn't, a lot of camera systems hadn't fully moved over yet to, to digital. There was actually still analog going on. And um, I just said, all right, man, you know, I'll start working with you. What do we got? And I met you uh, in 2012 at Daytona. <laughs> sorry. I, so, I, that, yeah, I, right I, out of the box, I, my career. I, just, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it's like, the, you know, the jinx. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, you're one of the first people I met I'm, outside I'm of my sorry. team. sorry. I gave you the Italian curse. Yeah, it was bad, but hey, you were the only other Nikon person. So I think when I came into the paddock, I was feeling a little, uh, you know, a little timid. That's right. Because, I I think it was like when on I, I think it was yeah it was Daytona. Did you say 2012? Or 11? Yeah, it would, have, it would have been 12. Cause yeah, yeah, it was around that time period. That's I'm like I remember you kind of like uh, 
you know what what's going on down here you know because like there's kind of like a different vibe like trying to take photos and video around there is kind of like a game you know some gates were open some places worked for you and they didn't and then you know all of a sudden i was kind of like yeah nothing makes sense here here come with me <laughs> so daytona it was just a nightmare that first year you know i, I don't know how long how you what you came in and what 2006 yeah 2005 six i yeah it's a blur <laughs> so i don't really i have no idea what it was like before that but i mean just daytona is just a mess and i know we're going to talk about it later but oh my god that whole first season and doing all that stuff so anyway yeah after chatting with you trackside and kind of learning the ropes and where not to stand for fire ants and all that kind of stuff you know just the normal progression of you always want to one up your next game you know you're you're only as good as your last piece of you know you know, photography or videography. So then it was just a matter of learning the ropes of the the paddock from, you know, people like you and Brian Jay, and then learning video as a means of, well, this is where everything's moving because nobody wants photos anymore. I mean, let me back that up. Everybody wants photos, but nobody ever wants to pay for photos. So, <laughs> so at Great. least, vi- yeah, at least video still has a little bit of, you know, monetary value. It's, you know, not working just for, you know, likes and, all that crap just yet so you know it's just a natural progression now do do you blame like facebook and instagram and all that you know social means out there destroying we're not destroying but making i guess the 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 focus of photography a little bit more complex as in like you have to deliver now video at short burst you know you need to deliver a 30 minute or 30 second you know a little burst video whatever alongside photos like you're not just doing one thing now you got a right. camera that can do both you know have at it you know is that what is that what's kind of like the curse nowadays you know I, it's hard to say what the real curse is because there's two things right if we're talking about photo then of course social media has been a massive reason as to why for some reason there's been a huge devaluation of or devaluation of photos for some reason, everything that we do, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even you know, Instagram, for God's sakes, is a photo-based platform, yet nobody's willing to pay for photos that are on there. It, it makes absolutely no sense. And, you know, when you start dealing with all of these, um, you know, influencers and whatnot who really aren't doing what they're supposed, you know, they're not in that system. They're not in that you know, bio or that, uh, what's the word, ecosystem, you know. They're just there in it for the content, for the likes, for that kind of stuff. And so nobody values the photography. In terms of video, I think, you know, I'm an old school guy. I like long format. I want to tell the story. I'm not, I didn't go to school for journalism, but I do want to tell a story. You know, as I've said before, you know, when we go on a race week and when when you and I show up, we're there for five days. And for us to put out a 30 second video over the course of five days, you know, I don't think we're doing our job. I don't think anybody really cares what you can do in 30 seconds when you have five days to shoot. But what happened in those five days and not just to the rider, but to the team as a whole, what happened in the track, what, you know, what was going on, what was the weather like, you know, Saturday is a completely different day from Sunday. You know, you and I, one of the things that we always complain about in our videos, and we're probably the only two that complain about it is the continuity of the weather. We're like, oh man, we're oh. trying to tell a story. So everything I shot on Friday when it was raining, it, it would be like road America. Road yeah. America was the one track that would always do that. It would always change. And I'm like, why? You know, it would yeah. be beautiful. And then all of a sudden, like, rain would set in. And then the sky would turn black. And then all of a sudden, bright again. You know? It's, yeah. It was always a, a, an odd mix. I, I don't know. You know, coming up with, with, with content nowadays, it's like just trying to get it out. Just try to get it out quicker, quicker, quicker. And that's... And I get that. Yeah. I, I totally get that. But at the same time, you know, that's why there's, diff- that's why there's different versions of us hanging around right there's there's kids that'll go out there and absolutely put together a 30 second banger as they call it you know and it it doesn't tell any story but it's it's fast and it's exciting and it uses copyrighted music and everybody gets excited about it okay great but over five days if that's all i've done what are you paying me for and that's where the and that's where the value is going less and less is because there's guys that are willing to work for less money to do nowhere near the amount of work and then when you come in and say, well, hey, look, I want to tell the story of your team. I want your sponsors to be represented equitably. I want all this. They look at you like you got something growing out of your forehead. And you're like, dude, I'm here just to help. 
I want to help you. I want to help you make money. I want to help you retain sponsorship dollars and maybe build something over the next couple of years. And if all you're interested in is a 30 second banger. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're definitely barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. It's, it's always comes down to the, the, I guess the younger gen- generation that's willing to do less and deliver more. But I, I, you know, have been kind of interested with, you know, your path specifically because you've got to travel a lot. Uh, you've gone overseas, you've covered different series. Mm-hmm. What, uh, you know, what, what is your favorite as far as like having unlimited creativity in a foreign unknown area to you, just, <laughs> just going in, just blind and, and, and one of those projects that just kind of like, well, listen, I'm, I'm going to enjoy yeah. this at the very end. And you knew it, you know, you know, getting into it. And at the very end, you, you, you finished off satisfied. What, what was that kind of like venue, that project? Well, in terms of hypothetical right now, it would be Isle of Man. And I know you got stories. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but for what reality was for me, it was Argentina, you know, um, you know, in 2018, I went down to Argentina with uh, uh, Graham Brown, you know, GB Images from the World Superbike Paddock for the inaugural race at the uh, Viacom circuit right there in uh, San Juan. And, you know, we were planning on taking an entire week before the race and riding these little 250cc, you know, Hondas around and just trying to have this adventure. And we really, really tried. It was something that we really wanted to happen and we did our best to film it, but you know, it's just, life is just a series of comedy of errors. And so, you know, we had unlimited creativity, but we didn't have unlimited cameras. We didn't have uh, known locations, you know, so we didn't see anything. Like when we saw a place we wanted to shoot, we didn't see it until we got there. So then we'd, ha- we'd go past it, go, hey, that was a good place. Run back, set up cameras, do two or three drive-bys in either direction, grab the cameras and go back and buy your when you're done with that, you've wasted an hour, you know, as opposed to just scouting a location and knowing what it is, but it was a lot of fun. Well, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, in this current environment and and to get back to, you know, what's, what's, what we're all experiencing here, you know, this, this quarantine with the pandemic, um, you know, really taking its toll on every industry. Um, You know, what, what is there to do as far as, uh, you know, what, if, if, I mean, what do you transition as far as like, is there still work in the motorcycle industry, even though, or the photography industry or the sports industry you buy you? Like, is there any kind of hope or any kind of chance you think with anything as far as showing some life, you know, like what's your opinion? Do you think life will come back to, to norm in the next couple of months or? Yeah, I definitely think it will come back to norm. I don't know what the life will be like in the in the paddock or the racing series because I know a lot of the the car guys are also asking the same questions. You know, when racing comes back, is there still going to be enough room for all of us to do what we do? Um, you know, I got to tell you, when it comes to the other sports, you know, I shoot baseball and hockey and football, and you know, from what I'm hearing right now, at least out of the agency that I work with, is that you know, there may not be fans at the sports, especially like when major league baseball comes back, because I know it's the first one in the pipe to return. And if there's no fans, then obviously there may be an opportunity to have more photographers and, you know, maybe the, maybe the photos are more valuable now because there's less access kind of going back to what we talked about before. That that's, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that because that's what I'm like, if all these series that we're involved in and just sports in general that have TV packages or streaming packages, there you go. You got your content from the comforts of your own living room and, you know, probably might enjoy the race more or whatever activity more on the comfort in your air conditioning couch. Right. You know, <laughs> with, yeah. You know, with all the toilet paper and paper towels <laughs> and cleaning products that you have that you stock right. up on, you know, but well, your hoard and <laughs> yeah, that you hoard it, you know, throughout the past several weeks. But you know, and and that's it. That that to me is like I I look at it as a golden opportunity because it's the content through your lens. You know, you don't have people there with their iPhones. You know, that right. that's the one thing I cannot stomach. And I look at it nowadays. I'm like, maybe this is a blessing. Less people thinking they can just put up an iPhone at an event or whatever and block your vision because, Ooh, I got this cool thing that we'll put on Instagram. You know, it's interesting because when you, you mentioned that, but when you go to uh, say, for example, the NFL or, you know, they're 
XFL before they disbanded here. When you're on the sideline of these major league teams, they actually pay people to be there with their cell phones, broadcasting, you know, through Facebook Live and whatnot to get that content out. So, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, what we do. They're still going to have those people on the sidelines because they still want to get that content out. And, you know, whatever we think of quality and whatever we think of anything, be damned, they're still going to do it. So I, I don't know, man. I know it's it's a double edged sword, but I'm just like I I the way I feel if we're gonna if sports the industry motorcycle racing you know in order to move forward you know let's embrace the current environments and just get out there. Enjoy necessarily watching a lot of the sports on television. I want to be there, and if I'm going to be at a football game, I'd much rather shoot it than be in the stands. Because if I'm going to watch it, I'll just be at home. Quite frankly. You know, yeah. so I'm not interested in live sports. So, you know, I think somewhere on Twitter, you know, there's all these questions, you know, hey, when sports come back, are you going to go watch it? Not if I can't get a credential, you know, I'll watch it on TV or, you know. <laughs> well, well that's, that's the thing is I, th- I, I think just with the power of iPhones and iPads or whatever, like I can just enjoy it from the comfort of my living room and just let racing begin. It just needs to start up. And, and oh, yeah. I, I could say like, hey, listen, you know, if it's going to start up in June, July, great. You know, but I don't. I don't think we need the fans uh, in, involved. I, I mean, that's just no. my opinion. I think, yeah. I think you can get away with that. Although, you know, you've got certain events like the WWE that shoots their content with no fans at the current moment. It just doesn't translate well. Can you but, imagine seeing Conor McGregor walk into a stadium that is empty? Yeah, it, it's just it's no. There's no it, impact. It's ridiculous. There's no impact. Yeah, no. They're they're no, and that's the thing is I I blame that on you know the the way they're going about shooting. They're not kind of I don't know thinking out of the box in order to kind of make it look a little bit different, a little bit tighter. You know, and that's the well, thing is I think if you just make it tighter shots, tighter framing, okay, it might just make it a little bit more more sense. But I mean, I I I feel like if we really focus on just making the content engaging out there, you know, now, you know, while, while people are sitting on at, at home, that's, what's going to kind of help catapult things. Because I think if, if things sit the way they are, I, I again, keyword sit, it's just going to be faded. It's just going to be faded oh, yeah. memories. And, and, mm-hmm. and I, and I hate to say it, it's just, I, I do see this trend, this pattern of, of just, it's just not, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just not evolving. Maybe it's just not evolving. People are just not adapting to it. Maybe it's just not being adaptable. Uh, you know, wh- how do you make things more popular nowadays? It's always kind of like a shock value. So I, I don't know what, what, what would be the next step to get it more, you know, more broadband, you know, more people, more yeah. audience members. So I don't know that's a, that's a, if, if, if racing doesn't kick in soon, it, it, I hate to say it could be a distant memory. Well, and that's the thing, you know, as I know, I, I know you play uh, like Gran Turismo and some of these other games. Have you seen these iRacing games that they've been doing? I, I uh, love it. I, I love it. I honestly, I can't get enough of it. I've come back to where I have used to be when I was younger with Sega and, and you know, early race games. Like Super now you're Mario. showing your age, old man. Yeah. Oh, no, I have to. I, I, I love those sports. And that's the fact that this has now become relevant. It's easier. It's more dynamic. It's more lifelike and it's fun and you can reach out and touch someone in the aspect of like yeah there's riders there's racers that race here in the united states and overseas and you can go online and find out their handle and play and and Mm -hmm. and it's it's very very uh what's the word i'm looking for uh disappointing (laughs) for the ego because I have gotten my ass handed to me by several, several racers, even at the amateur level. And I'm like, I'm not worthy. I'm not even going to attempt to be anything cool online. There's no way. Well, you see where there, uh, there's even, um, what is it? Is it, I think it, I think it might be Drew Gibson. He's, he's a, um, he's an endurance, uh, photographer. And I think he works with Bentley and Lexus. And I think he actually he gets paid to actually create photographs of the races. So while you know he he sees the replays and then goes back and quickly frames up some images, takes those screen grabs, and he's being paid as a working photographer in the iRacing leagues. You know why not? Why not? I I, I think it's great. I, I can't think it's, do it. <laughs> I think it's you know and that's the thing is you can wrap your head and do it you know and get into the technology and and how to pull it off, but. 
it's interesting you know there's a there's a need you know there's a oh, need yeah. for that and i and i i think that's what's the interesting part now is that there's there's certain race entities that are embracing the e-series the online series and i think that's what's going to keep the sport going i think it's going to keep it moving forward you know well, here's downtime. a conspiracy for you <laughs> what if this whole thing was started by like ea sports to just kill all other legitimate sport and everything go to e-racing right I, i've mm-hmm. heard a lot of conspiracies this is a good one this is a good I, one because i i have not heard this one but i feel like uh this might be legit this is the this is the one that i'm like you know what out of all the ones EA Sports back, created Coronavirus. Yes, yes. Not Bill Gates, not anyone else. Nope, nope. Oh, man, that's interesting. And, that's a, so, and then think about it. Like, you're going to be able to take your Zero or your, your Damon motorcycle, you know, these guys that are producing these, uh, you know, race-style motorcycles, and you're just going to plug your, your Xbox or your PlayStation right into the bike. You can just sit in your garage and just make vroom vroom noises because the bike's electric. It doesn't make any noise. Well, well here's, 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 now you got onto something that I was like, you know what? I'm not going to bring up because people are going to be like, he's a little, whew. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know how in this day and age we're all expecting hoverboards and all these cool little gadgets to be now, mm-hmm. but they're not. I expected there to be like another motorcycle evolution, like Tron cycles, like Tron oh. light cycles. Watched it the other night. So mm-hmm. that's what that's what the, the point I'm trying to make is like you know with 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 Damon bikes and all these other bikes that are coming out. I know BMW had launched a while ago a bike mm-hmm. that that's that's upright. It's permanently upright. You know. They, yeah. And that's, let's not forget, you and Charlie just came up from Argentina on the Harley. Yeah, you know, but but Yamaha put out a, a motorcycle that had a robot on it. But <laughs> I, I thought that's what the evolution is. I thought we'd be here already with you know motorcycle racing, motorsport racing, with that kind of technology, that kind of tech. That hey, this is the next level. You know, I, we're doing things could, with a little bit, you know, a little bit more electric. I think if you could make a light ribbon come out, that would kill your opponent. Awesome. I think I'm all in. That is a whole nother podcast because I swear it really is becoming more and more and more relevant. But I, I really do feel like, you know, what, how do you take motorsports, you know, and take it indoors or do something? Like, what's the evolution? You know, maybe is it, I don't know, making one engine spec and putting in like maybe a certain frame that's two wheels and racing that and then changing that engine to something that's maybe three wheels or you know four wheels i don't know like something interchangeable you know but maybe using a spec engine because i don't know uh, about you but a lot of these three wheel bikes you know that are coming out can't some of them got hayabusa engines in it you know suzuki Mm -hmm. yamaha kawasaki engines why not something you know like a race league that kind of embraces that you know but make it interchangeable make it modern and techie Dude, I don't know, man, but I, you know, this, the, the e-bike thing is one of those, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, right? Because definitely internal combustion engines at some point are going to go away. They just have to, you know, we, it's just a resource issue, you know, unless we find oil on other planets, which we could. I but mean, I, I, we're not I, there yet. As I know we're not there yet, but, and, and God, I don't want to get rid of two strokes or four strokes. I love anything. Oh, fantastic. Past, but I, I feel like there's got to be like an electronic part to it it's well, just so gotta, he, there's got to be the hook to it like, i think it would be great but see most people like are, are probably a lot like us in terms of when when you talk about what's it going to take to get people racing it you know or the fans back is that you know we've we've discussed many times that it's a visceral thing right it sounds it's loud you can you can smell the gas you can smell the brakes you can you can hear it for miles away e-bikes by all rights are way more exciting I mean, well, well, an electric like, engine. Zero. So on that, so on that note, what about like VR, virtual reality, putting the goddamn goggles on and pretending no, you're I, actually at the track? You know, like, I still want go. racing. I don't want virtual racing. I still want racing. I still yeah. want to see who has the skill. I mean, you know, using your thumbs. Okay, that's exciting. But an athlete, right? You got to use your whole body. That's kind of what well, I no, look at. Well, so no, racing. Good. I'm not downplaying that, but I'm saying, do you really have to be there, though, in order to enjoy no, that experience? You know, could it be translated from the comfort of your home or on a bus, on a train, on your commute to work, again, when, when you feel like it? Because I, I don't know about you, with this quarantine, I think I've seen everything on the internet. I've seen everything on <laughs> Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. Pro- I've actually canceled certain accounts because I'm like, I've seen it all. But it's with my access, I can go online and do certain things. And 
catch up on racing to so i'm like do you really need to be at the track anymore you know Dude. is that the new evolution is that the new nope. segue nope you got to watch your science fiction man every single science fiction movie there's always people at the races. You can watch Star Wars. I know it happened thousands of years in the past, but there's people at the races. If you watch anything where there's a uh, uh, Speed Racer, the uh, Speed Racer movie, yeah. right? Total Futuristic, even Tron. There's people packing the stands. People want to see the racing. I, you know, it's one thing to put on a headset and, ooh, I virtually saw a virtual race. Huh, okay. Or, you know, I'll never forget when GP returned to Indianapolis. For I, I got to say, as far as an event... I've never thought I'd be able to tell my kids, like, I shot something through a fucking hurricane. <laughs> it was amazing. I was in the stands, so I was having a great time. I, I, I went through three cameras that day. Or that, that yeah, yeah, three cameras. And, and that's the thing is, like, I, great. I never thought I'd have experienced that at a, at a motorcycle race, especially but at a MotoGP race. Okay, so you were working it, but I was there for a fan. And when you're asking from a fan's perspective, where are we going to go racing? I look, I'm still excited about it because it was fantastic we were miserable we were soaked we were frozen cold when the was it when the wind changed direction you know when the, when the race started all the wind flags were going this way and then all of a sudden whoosh. i remember going out there for for work and coming mm -hmm. home and going <laughs> i went yeah. through three cameras and i think i have some good stuff and uh yeah it wasn't good <laughs> <laughs> not so good yeah no but it was fun i think that's what it's going to take i i don't think and it's just my opinion. I don't think people are going to be content just watching racing on TV. I think there's always going to be those people. I'm one of them that would much rather be there. Yeah. I don't care what it is. I mean, you make the e-bike sound like ice cream trucks going around the track, at least in something. They're too quiet. Yeah. Now I, I, I just, I, I just feel like if there's going to be some additional level, it, it needs to be, I guess more production in involving the camera work, the, the mm -hmm. placement of certain things to give it that much more of a, a an edge. Um, but then also, you know, with the motorcycle, motorcycles, you know, with motorsports in general, it's just I've always kind of envisioned, you know, like I know F one was doing it years ago, like a curse system, you know, some kind of yep. way to get that energy and use it at certain times and certain advantages on uh, your racing. I'm like, oh, that'd be amazing if motorcycle racing here in the united states could do that or just motorcycle racing period you know i i don't mm -hmm. know i don't know either man i don't know i don't know what it's going to take for sure but yeah it's got to start like I, you know I'm, I'm, you I'm a dreamer that's what it is I'm, I'm a dreamer i'm trying to to just envision motorcycle racing being 24 7 you know all season long and it's hard to vision you being an optimist i'm just this is a I, new weird thing I'm trying to get my head around. <laughs> it's it's a new me. I, I you know it takes me being in quarantine for almost two months for me to be optimistic. <laughs> Man, if it, this is it, what it took. We should have done it years ago. I know. You know, really, and that's what it comes down to. I I I feel like this quarantine, to be very truthful, I've been very blessed that. My family and I have been healthy and, and protected, and, and we've got good family and friends around us just in case. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my conversation, you know, of, of how I experienced I was actually away uh, for work, wrapping up uh, a, a, a work endeavor in the desert covered in mint 400. And so I had family and friends take care of my family until I got back here and just made sure and quarantined and, you know, just took care of the family. But I had people that just reached out and that's what the good thing is. And, you know, on, on, on that note, um, wow, I forgot where I was going with that for a second. Damn hey it. man, welcome to the ramble. There's the ramble. Oh, it's it got me. It, it's mm -hmm. quarantine. Yeah, no, it, but the, the, the blessing is I feel like I've been able to kind of collect my thoughts and, in, in, in kind of, charge up the batteries and i feel like that's what like you know when you're working in motorsports covering that it, it it takes the life out of you it really does it's it's a very intense kind of uh, uh process you know and, right. and you know how does that affect you how does that affect you off the job you know how does it affect you when you are home with the family how do you decompress or do you take your work home with you well and yeah of try to, we... and try to manage that well i mean if of course, we take our work home with us. I mean, we, you know, we spend five days capturing content, then we got to spend the next at least week or so trying to get it out before it's no longer relevant, right? So, of course, we bring it home. And you, you nailed it. I think anybody who works on in what we do in motorsports, you understand that. I mean, it's just a slog. You know, 
it's hard to remember everything that you shot. It's hard to keep that catalog, but when you're in it, you can, it's a little bit easier. You can do it. You don't get too fogged up, but it's just that day after day after day of, you know, sometimes you're on track for 12, you know, 12 hours. And in some places you don't even get, you know, shade. And then you've got to then try to get back, record everything that was happening at the trailer, get interviews if you need to get it, maybe get three, four hours of sleep and then back at it. It's rough. So coming home, you know, when the work is done, like on the PR side of things, I tried to get, I tried to get everything out by Tuesday, right? Cause that's when the magazines want to get you know, their photos and the story and the press release is all got to be done. And then I tried to get videos done by Thursday. And then what that does is that gives me Thursday as like my Friday. Cause I don't have the kids that day. You know, my wife is working. Then that, that's the one day a week I give myself. And so during this quarantine, what I try to do is I try to give myself either a Wednesday or a Thursday off where I don't try to touch my computer. And if I do, I'm doing something that's just inane, something that just doesn't matter. I, I had to, uh, you know, kind of just detox, like almost like t- tell the wife, like just take the phone and just put it somewhere. I yeah. don't care anywhere. Yeah. Cause I, I just need to just not hold technology or be around it. And uh, you know, there was actually a point where I, I didn't actually like picking up my Nikon at certain points. Cause I'm like, mm. It, it just felt like work and you know once you turn on it's kind of hard to turn off you know and that's yeah. where you know on on that note has there ever been a project that you've been involved in where you lose sleep or it's, it's so intense you're so anxious because with with covering motorsports again if you're, you're doing this in a more documentary kind of feel you have to be responsive you have to mm-hmm. be alert and you know on on point to a certain extent you know always willing to record or, or always recording you know you mm-hmm. you wake up at sun you know sunrise you don't go home to sunset but what has been like your i don't know if it was just a one-time thing or a, an event you're at or experience what was that one project that made you just kind of lose sleep gave you that that nervous energy just like you know mm. this is it i gotta nail it um i think in terms of video projects, I think it would have to be, was it 2016? I think it might've been, no, 20, either 2015 or 2016. I think it was the, I think it might've been 2015 when Gagne won the uh, Superstock Championship. And we knew we were going for it. And I wanted everything about that season because it was the last year that we were going to be running with Red Bull. It was all these things. So and I, And we were also had a full calendar that year and we were visiting I think we were visiting, I don't know, I can't remember all the tracks, but, you know, the, the, the standard tracks, and I really want to knock those out of the park. And so as the guy who's setting up not just the cameras, but the remote cameras, I want to make sure I get my time lapses done. I want to make sure I get all these things done. So, yeah, you're, you're sleeping maybe an hour or two a night on a weekend and just trying to get everything right. And then if you miss something, you're like, oh, man, I got to call Jake, you know, and I got to try to get him good, clean audio because the audio you want it to match. Mm-hmm. And so... I think that was the year that I probably had my least amount of sleep. Yeah, I, uh, I, I feel from 2014 to maybe 2017, I didn't sleep. It was almost yeah. like three years <laughs> just well, of, of just volume of, of going and sleeping in hotels and just going, what's the point? I mean, it's no. four hours sleep by the time I'm getting done with work food, mm-hmm. digitizing, working some more, you know, prepping for the next day, making sure every damn battery is charged, every lens is clean, you know, dot my eyes, crossing my T's. It's two in the morning, so you got to get up at five. What's the point? You know, so the coffee year, became my best friend. Yeah, the year that we did all the stuff with uh, Moto America, that was 16, right? So that would have been Jake was a 15. Was, yeah, yeah 16, 16. Yeah. So that, yeah, that was the year I got all my stuff stolen. But I mean, oh my God! Did, did yeah, we... that's that's the year that I. Uh, yes, yes, we were all involved in. You got so upset and... about my equipment getting stolen that you vomited. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Now, I, it, it's it's funny. We we could talk about this and laugh, but I'm I never, ever had more of a. I, I feel like I I feel like I witnessed somebody's like just dying you know it just felt it was just ice cold like holy shit we just were outside five minutes ago and then the look that you had we looked at my you know my rental vehicle which is right next to yours unscathed your truck is just blown out i'm like and yours 
twice the size with twice the amount of equipment, and it was my shit that got stolen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But so. uh, it was uh, hard drives that we we shot yep. with that pretty much that's i think that's the reason why i vomited <laughs> i think i think well, that was like wait so we don't have any proof of what we just did for i don't know four days uh, you know and i i just still to this day remember going to the airport and remember having a a conversation with wayne rainey uh telling him that um yes all the contents you hired us for that just uh uh yes was stolen yeah, uh, but the the silver lining was, and again, you could take it away, Corey. Things were retrieved and retrieved rather quickly. Yeah, with respect so. to the hard drives, man, those things were found. I got a call. See, that happened first thing in the morning, and then I think about one thirty in the afternoon after I had given up going to all the different uh, uh, pawn shops in the area because Salinas, California, it's got a lot of pawn shops. I was on my way home, and then I got a phone call saying, hey, we retrieved a couple boxes. So I turned right back around, drove another four hours back up north, um, got there, and sure enough, man, they had the hard drive just sitting right there. So it was anything that they couldn't actually physically roll if they had to carry it, and thank God the hard drives were in a uh, – you had them in a Pelican briefcase. And, yeah, uh, and, and, and so, that's the thing is, thank God – and that's why I think I swear by Pelicans from now from, – from, now to the day I die, I will never have another case that's not a Pelican case because they lock, they're, they, they're bulletproof. Oh, they were amazing. Yeah, they, they saved our bacons. Well, my mm -hmm. bacon, our bacons. <laughs> yeah, at least we got the hard drives back immediately. So at least we, hey, you know, we didn't miss a beat. We were able to get the content out that week just on time. You know, the transition to, to you, Corey, we, we never got to, to talk about uh, things about how we, we were working on projects. I know we got to talk about you going to Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, that experience, but do we want to talk about um, our projects? Do we want to talk about the pilots that we kind of worked on? Yeah, do, do we to. Do we want to roll the pilots? Do we, or, do we want do to we do want it to, here? Or? Well, do we want to pretend? <laughs> just, <laughs> just for sake of time. And roll the video. Motorcycle riding is is an adventure that lasts a lifetime motorcycling is something that connects us all to the environment around us motorcycles always kind of play a second fiddle cars and i don't understand why because you don't really get that excitement in a car you don't really get to feel that excitement with a windshield in front of you you don't feel the adrenaline rush with a seat belt strapped to you you don't feel that exposure to the elements you feel that on the open road you know, being in the moment. It's just you and the road. Motorcycling is, is a tactile, visceral experience. Every motorcycle is unique. Every motorcycle has got a personality. And why not expose that personality on camera? I think part of the reason why we all ride motorcycles, whether it's a cruiser, a, a, an adventure bike, a sport bike, a scooter, which are fun. I don't care what anybody says, scooters are fun. We do it for a lot of different reasons, but mainly because it connects us. You know, what we've learned is that, you know, whether the motorcycle is a big bike or a small bike, you know, you can still have the adventure, you can still travel the world. It's going to have it all. You're on road, you're off road, it's going to have speed, it's going to have the adrenaline, it's going to have the cool factor. What else do you need more in a motorcycle show? The show is everything. The show is everything to us, and it's everything about motorcycles, and we want to take you on that journey. We want to bring you along. It's going to put you right there. It's going to make you feel like you're in the saddle. It's for everybody. It's for people that are looking to, to follow us on our adventures. We're looking to go out. We're looking to go explore and to go explore in two wheels. It's a journey, and we'd like to take you along. Yeah, absolutely. We can talk about it. I mean, you know, there's no secret, you know, when I think when any two creative people get together, they're going to try to come up with some kind of a plan to, you know, in our world, you know, show new content, do something new and exciting. So, you know, we put together that pilot where the two of us, you know, kind of showed our wares a little bit. You know, I had just come off the Argentinian trip and you had uh, you had some help. I think it was Brock go around New York with you. Uh, Wei Wei. No, actually, yeah. Brock yeah, we we had uh, we had the, the usual uh, suspects yeah. involved yeah. and uh, asking favors and 
utilizing uh you know a truck my home truck as a camera truck and going throughout the area mm -hmm. and it, it just uh, you know putting together content isn't easy but it, it's definitely rewarding and that's the one thing is that you know shooting stuff and putting content together was was rewarding although yeah. wah, wah, you know it didn't really follow through but you know the the, the project's you know, is a, is a good, expressive, creative outlet. You know, well, and, yeah, and it's a oh, and, and it does seem like hopefully there there might be some things promising in the near future. But you know, well, I mean, my whole thing was is that you know I'm finally going through and I'm doing my full Argentina uh, Argentina edit. You know, that's one thing I I've had on the back burner and it's just taken up final space. But you know, I've never put together a full thing. I just gave clips for that pilot that we tried to do. But you know, going back through it's kind of re reignited my desire to, to to do more travel and to do more, you know, writing and filming it. You know, it's definitely tougher. You don't cover the amount of miles that you would normally. You know, if you had a third person who was dedicated to film you and you guys planned out all your stops and where you were going to film. But, you know, I, I definitely want to get back into it. And I want to still try to pursue that concept that we had together you know we're the two of us on separate coasts working together to create a single format content so and and that's the thing is you know the the, the technology talking about you know working together and working now under quarantine you know working remotely you know has has been kind of second nature to us and and has been you know the technology has existed for quite some time but uh you know i you know to talk about you know the the first pilot we worked on it, it I, I felt there was a need to have a little bit of flavor, review bikes, but not be too serious about it, to go on adventures and, and go under challenges. And again, take it serious at times, but not too serious, but give it a different perspective. And that's what I, I think we tried to create with our, our first pilot. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, I'm, I would be a terrible reviewer for bikes because I'm not a technical person. I, you know, I look at it and I go, oh, two wheels, it's got a throttle. I've I can fucking ride it. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, but this one's got, you know, this new feature and it's got, and I'm like, is it fucking cool? Can I ride it? Does it make me smile? Hey, can I yeah. do it? <laughs> you know, that's all I give a shit about. Now, now the second pilot that we tried, this was, this was something that we've been talking and talking and talking and talking and the line. We wanted, uh, fingers crossed and just never got past go. I, I, you know, it's yeah, a strange it environment to talk about, but I guess we'll just roll it. There's a place where every racer wants to be. A place that separates heartbreak from the victory. A place where nothing can touch you, but disaster is all around. A place that many seek, few find, and even fewer can stay. This place is not a myth, but it can make legends. There's a perfect balance of racer and machine. It, it is, is the line. The line. Yeah, you know, so when you when you see what what you're trying to do here is the whole concept was to show, you know, this balance, right? You know, the what racers really have to go through, the focus that they do. You know, I, I know there was a lot of subcontext that we were trying to interject with the series, but you know, and a lot of people have tried to do uh, a racing documentary type series, but you know, at the time, you know, we were the ones that had all the access and all that stuff, and we really, I think, produced a hell of a polished trailer for something that we just kind of did at barber you know? yeah i would have loved to have seen it go somewhere that that's that's the thing is uh you know it it had all the makings and and really i mean it still has the makings you know and and the one genuine thing that i felt and still true to this day is that I, i'm i'm a kid at heart i want to see the things that i love excel and the outlets that we have and the access to we have of, as far as the confidence in riders and the confidence of people and the things at stake and the timing of it that we could have captured that that essence you know we we right. could have we could have we could have we could have but no yeah. I, I i truly feel that you know people are genuine when they're comfortable around you right. you know they're not gonna just oh okay camera's on it and it can you know, Josh kind of even mentioned it, uh, you know, in a soundbite, you know, some people shut down and they try to convey certain things. It just doesn't come across because there's so much going on that they want to say the right things. Right. So where with that in mind, you know, I felt like this was a genuine pro approach of getting something pure, you know, getting yeah. something that that just can translate on a human level. You don't have to be 
in the sport to know you could just tune in and go that's a human emotion i can relate to fear or laughter or happy right. sad tragedy you know those are the things that i'm like this is a finger on the pulse and well mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> i can well, tell you where i can tell you where that finger went <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to know. But you know, when we conceptualize <laughs> that, I don't think uh, F one. I don't think that F one show had come out yet. I'm sure it was definitely in the can when they were working on it because they were filming that season. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's something that you know, F one Drive to Survive really captured was you don't have to be a fan of the sport. You just have to like drama and emotion, and then it works. And I gotta say, it does a good yeah. job of capturing the drama and emotion, and in such a various way. We'll kick it right off, and and, and right off the bat, Josh, you, you don't need any introduction. Uh, we we are coming with Joshua Curtin Hayes over here, proud father. Um, with and the Hawkster. With the Hawkster. Poor fella. Oh man. Poor fella. My goodness. You've been cute. You've had now, him out riding all day, I'm sure. But I, I noticed uh, he's, he's got a haircut. Did, you, did your uh, son also cut your hair, too, or no? Oh, you mean I got uh, a haircut? Hey, yeah, did, did dude, you get a haircut, too? Dude, my mom cuts my hair. What's your excuse? Dude, I, <laughs> That's my, a good one. My excuse. <laughs> and, and, we, and we already went through this earlier, Corey. I, you know, if you look here and Show him a side view. Yeah, this is. Josh, you got to see this. It, dude, it, I'm, so, I'm seeing it on the other screen there. It's so bad. It's so dude, bad. <laughs> you totally did that yourself, didn't you? No, no, no. I cannot. You did not pay somebody to do that. To I did, no, I honestly, I did not pay for it, but I did pay with this haircut because of my son. I just said, I just told I said, Ben, please just kind of oh, be gentle. I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. Yeah, he's, he's three. I mean, like, what kind Did of you have it yesterday? Oh yeah, yeah. This is this. No, no, no. This was it's actually, worse than it's worse than Saturday. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This this was last night. This was last night. Mm. This went down again. And because I think I, I made something about his hair. I said something about his haircut yesterday about like knowing somebody's from New York the minute you see them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what the thing is? After all these years, after all these effing years. I'm from New Jersey, damn it. You still keep us yeah, in New York. Yeah, whatever. It's all the same, <laughs> it's all the same I do, right? I do know that because I was screaming about the Jersey Shore. Oh, oh, man, there you go. There's the proof. No, oh, my goodness. Oh. I mean, I've actually had to talk about this a lot recently. You know, three years ago, I was a racer, and sometimes I was a husband. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. now, uh, Corey and I have had this conversation a few times. Now I'm a dad, a husband, a coach. Uh, a therapist if you talk about Bobby Fong and once in a while I get to race motorcycles <laughs> oh there's a subject that's good we don't have Bobby on we don't have Bobby on yet but we gotta throw him under the bus but yeah I hey, mean, Bobby. That's, that's gotta be interesting that like ha have you been looking at yourself now with a with obviously racing on pause have you been working with a lot of riders uh you know kind of training still or doing anything online training no, what, what? no everybody's everybody's on their own and just trying to figure out what to do because for the most part like especially here in california we haven't been able to ride can't even go ride motocross so there's really nothing happening so right now it's just a matter of finding a way to stay and keep your fitness and don't panic because nobody's riding you got the beauty of having something in your backyard is that helping you keep your sanity under quarantine conditions i mean is that keeping you yeah, but we haven't ridden but we haven't ridden motorcycles all i've done is work on my backyard and try to entertain the wet spot over here <laughs> <laughs> but, we, saw, we, saw, we saw melly on her trials bike it looks like she was doing right yeah you know she's been having some fun she wanted some new things so uh, it's funny uh, all the crossfitters are upset so they can't go to the gym so when she reached out to the guy with the tractor tires he's like damn i'm almost sold out everybody wants to flip tires <laughs> in their yard right now <laughs> so she uh but she got a couple and and we started kind of working on a trials course and stuff, but we've been so busy, like doing all these things. It's it's crazy. We're actually getting an incredible amount of stuff done that we would have never had time to do if we weren't forced to stay home. You know, Josh, what's the dynamic before you know everything came to a screaming halt? Uh, what was the dynamic like of just being a family with? your son with racing still being involved your your wife uh you know being a a race team owner you being the rider 
you know, and also now with her, I, I, and I want to again correct me if I'm wrong, announcement of, of racing flat track. What what does that feel like? You know, you got to wear a lot of hats. You know, is it something that is you know up the game in the household where you, know, you guys are up up early in the morning to get things going, or how is it like? Hell, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. You know, it's kind of like when people ask Melissa, what's it like to be a girl and a racer? And she's like, I don't know. I've never been anything else, <laughs> you know? Touché, so, yeah. you know, like, I, I mean, basically when, when we, when we talked about even having a baby, we, we said, look, we, we live this blessed and amazing life, you know? And like, we don't want to stop doing that. We just want to add a cool little buddy to ride with to the, to the thing the problem is you got to go through a couple of hard years before you can get to the fun stuff really like that we had pictured it as fun it's been a different kind of fun but um so and working very hard and it's been quite expensive to have friends and child care and all the things that you need for us to live a somewhat normal life of what we have lived for the past you know 12 15 years together mm -hmm. so uh, it's been an adventure every day we learn something but that's just like being married to melissa every day i learn something okay <laughs> okay he's, play, he's playing it safe, he's playing it safe. <laughs> she, she must have come home she's probably yes, in your shot yes yes no, no, the look mostly that all married men you know? <laughs> after all these now how long have you been married to melissa for Twelve and a half years. Twelve, 12 and a half years. Oh, the magic's still there. That's um, I'm I'm going on eight, and let me just tell you, we or is it thirteen? Oh. oh no, th yeah, this year it'll be thirteen. So twelve and a half years. We waited ten before we had a baby to make sure we liked each other enough that we were going to stick <laughs> it out. <laughs> He's thorough. He's very thorough. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 but I, I mean, I'm I'm going on eight years. I've known my wife for like ten to twelve, but I look at her and she looks at me like. Come on, guys. Like, you know, like, you're not going anywhere. What do you think? Wait, so how old's, your kid? how old's your oldest? My oldest is five. And my, uh, my son right, is So you were only married three years? Uh, yeah, a couple of years. Ago. See, we were, we were still like, hmm, I don't know. I'm not sure about you yet. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> see, you guys, you guys, see, we're all the same age here. And yeah. I, have, I have an 18-year-old and two 14-year-olds. Yeah, so you guys need to catch up. I'm just saying. It was pretty Insane. funny because having Cameron Bobier as a teammate one day, I remember telling him, you know, dude, if I'd started early, you could be my kid. And he was like, no <laughs> way, dude. And I go, if I started at like 19 with a kid, you'd be my kid. And he was like, damn, <laughs> you know. Do you look at it as, as a, a blessing that you're having, you know, Hawk in your life now, instead of having maybe like earlier on in the career, do you think maybe you would kind of – be hindered from doing things because I, the, the the thing is now as I years go on I get to know you a little more. You traveled overseas. You've raced overseas a lot. You know, do you think maybe that would have kind of swayed your your mindset to do something else or maybe play close to home? It's hard for me to tell. I I, I don't know how to answer. You know, like I wanted kids when I was twenty, and then after a while. I got so busy and selfish just being an athlete that I kind of thought, well, maybe it's just not going to be for me. You know, I was pretty late finding Melissa. I met her when I was 30. And so by the time we decided to have a kid at 40, all I can tell you is that that first year being married to my wife, who also had her own hopes, dreams, and desires and all those things out there, if we had had Hawk while I was still actively racing, it would have been the, uh, an ugly end to my career. <laughs> it wouldn't have been, really? you know, like it, it's the hardest thing we've ever gone through. And it's very, very much, I mean, like, of course, when he was breastfeeding, it was, it leaned a bit more on her, but I worked really, really hard to help her still reach the, the goals that she had set for herself to be back to fitness, back to riding, back to doing this and competing. and The same promises that we had talked about before having the kid of wanting to keep our life and not stop our life because we're having a child. It was only fair that I do my part, my part so that she could reach the goals that she had laid out beforehand. 
And I could have just probably walked away and said, no, I'm sorry, it's on you. But then it would have been a terrible marriage. <laughs> and it's hard enough with a with an infant and a toddler without all that mess. So, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, he, he's a part of my everyday decisions. I've gone, you know, now three times to Australia to race twice in that Island Classic and once an Australian Superbike. There's talk of me traveling around with girl off a little bit in europe and like there was at one time i had been talking to joe roberts a little bit and there was never even a question you know melissa was like no man if, if this is what you need to do then you need to do it so she's always got my back in that way but does it weigh on me a little bit yeah. and and i but i i tell you what this this quarantine deal has given me a, a new appreciation for hawk um, because I haven't been able to be so busy that, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, there's a lot of times where you're spending your time with your child, but it's like having a phone close by where you're constantly looking at it to see if somebody sent you a text message or something else. So I was always like, man, I really want to play tennis today. I really want to play golf today. I really want to go get on my bike today. I want to ride some motocross. And so you're always trying to rob Peter to pay Paul and his time becomes a big part of that. And you're looking for a way that, okay, can I get him to daycare? Can we find, some, you know, this and that so that we can still do our things because it's hard to do it with him. And the time that I've gotten to spend with him in the last month and a half and where he is in his growth has been so much fun and quite the adventure, really. I mean, uh, we do have a babysitter come help out a couple of days a week. Sorry, I know I'm long-winded. No, no. You know, you, the, the thing is, you make it impossible to hate you, Josh Hayes. What you said was so beautiful. And I'm like, this son of a bitch. Like, I can't say anything bad about him. He just yeah. he says something so nice like that. You know? Yeah, I'll it's give you something. Fun. I'll come up with something. I know. I know. But, like, you know, I've been coming home from my bike rides. It's finally in the 80s here. And we're like sweating our butts off. And we go and jump in the pool. And he comes and bails in the pool with us. And he was so cute today because the pool's still in like the low low 70s like 71 and i'm you know i'm coming in there full sweating from 90 degrees but it feels cold when you get it and he gets in and dude he's like head to toe goosebumps and his little lips trembling for a minute and you're splashing each other and he's running around and it's been a lot of fun but I, that's, I, that's, I your, that's your little buddy and that's i guess like i mean the way i i see it and sometimes i i don't maybe i'm assuming on Instagram, like you, you do bring him apart on, on rides. Do you bring your son into your training? I mean, do you make your son a part of the training, you know, because, you know, it's one, getting... <laughs> you're occupying the time, but two, maybe it's laying the foundation of, you know, train him young, you know, if he's going to go follow daddy's footsteps, do you think that's the, the best foot forward for you, you know, in your approach? Look, I, I hope my kid rides motorcycles his whole life but I hope he plays tennis or he's a golfer. <laughs> like, I, I really don't care what he does. He has an aptitude, or I think, for bicycles and motorcycles. He loves two wheels, but he sees mom and dad do it every day. Um, right. The problem is he's never going to know how hard it is already because the day he was born, Danny Walker gave us a TTR 50 for him. Mm -hmm. Mom bought him an offset. Like, he, we had a, a Strider at the house before he was born as like a baby shower gift from Alex Asante. I mean, like he is, uh, all right, I'm going to show you something real quick here. Melissa went by the local shop and found, <laughs> and found a, a BMX bike with three piece cranks and pedals Ooh. for a kid his size. And he can't quite grasp the concept because he's been on a strider, not on tricycles and stuff with pedaling. So here's what we did. Oh, it's, that's cool. Nice. So it's propped up on his ramp on a trainer for a big bike. But then the freewheel made more noise than the <laughs> and pedaling it the correct way. So I had to go get a bunch of zip ties and put them in the spokes so it makes noise going the right way. But now <laughs> he climbs up that contraption four or five times a day just to turn the pedals over and make noise for a little while. And it, I have a, a feeling that at any point 
I'm going to pull that thing off of there. We're going to put him on him and say, just don't stop pedaling. And he's going to ride off into the sunset, you know? Dude, but, he's got no fear. I've seen it firsthand. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, with your, with your race career, with Melissa's race career, you know, the team, everything, just, just running a family. I don't, I, my hat goes off to you. Cause that's, a, I don't, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you sleep. We don't either. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what what's like a, a, a typical day? I mean, are you up at like 5 a.m. and like one of those parents by like 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you barely keep your eyes open? No, actually, he's, so he sleeps downstairs below our room and still has kind of a big crib that he can't get out of. And uh, he wakes up generally between 6, 6.30 and 7.30 now. It took a long time. But generally, 6.30 to 7.30, he wakes up, and I'll hear him down there. And he'll say one or two, hey, daddy, hey, mommies, but not much. And he'll just entertain himself for a good half hour, 45 minutes, playing in his crib. I stack his crib with toys all along the rim, so when he wakes up, he has all of the stuff he wants to play with. And he just entertains himself for a little while. So we eventually get up. I come down, usually changing, and start, I feed Huckleberry. I start making him and Melissa eggs and get coffee going and stuff like that, get everybody fed while Melissa gets her stuff together and comes down. Then her and Hawk will sit down and eat, and I'll go upstairs and I'll get dressed and get a few things together. And then uh, if it's babysitter day, well, this is all quarantine stuff. If it's babysitter day, she's here at 9. We usually get on our bicycles and take off and go for a ride. If it's not, we figure out how the day's going to go out between the two of us. What, what does each of us have on our schedule or a plan for the day? And then usually Melissa's been coming in about five thirty or six, making dinner. Seven thirty eight, we get him in the bathtub, the war, just kind of get him ready for going to sleep. He naps typically from twelve thirty to two thirty. We're having a rough day today. Um, I've I've never been over there. Do you have bikes in your garage? You know, all around. You know, the, what what's currently in the stable? What do you have access to? <sighs> You got how much time you got? <laughs> well, really, really, I want to hear. I want to hear more. We have we have eighteen motorcycles here at least. Eighteen. So I mean, we have. Let, let's, oh, man, I have two loaners from Yamaha. I have an MT10 and an MT3, MT03. We have the jet skis. Um, I have eight TTRs. We've got the Stasic, his Osset, his TTR50, a TTR110. Mine and Melissa's motocross bikes, mine and Melissa's uh, dirt track bikes. I have an R1. She has an R1. We have the R6. Do you have uh, any of your bikes from championships? So I was going to say, uh, what, what about the ones I, in the house? Okay, yeah. So <laughs> I've got my 2010 bike is over behind the rail back there, if you can see it by the surfboards. Do you see it? Excellent. And then downstairs, I have the 2015 R1 when it changed, serial number one. Ooh, mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. Now, out of, out of all the, the bikes that you've gone on, because, you know, talking to you early before we hopped on, you've been racing quite some time, and you've been racing in I don't know how many different series. Like, what was the bike that, and again, I know you're a Yamaha guy. I know it. But I, I asked this question, what was your – worst experienced bike that you've ridden or raced and what is probably your favorite bike that you've raced <laughs> you know like i rode a, a full gambit of bikes you know i've ridden so many different ones i would say uh the, the hard thing is each of them right over time you kind of they each kind of become yours and special or different in a different way um I remember having like a when I when I think fondly and look back on a few motorcycles, the previous Gen R one that I had so much success with was great, of course. Um, in uh, the the Honda six hundred, both models, the 06 and 07, 08, I had a lot of success with those. They felt like home. I had some pretty good luck with GSXR seven fifties not in the early days i did i won my first championship but it still probably wasn't one of my better bikes the gsxr 1000 i never felt like i got along with all that good um 
the Honda 929 way back in the day. I actually had some, I had a pretty good run with that thing. And uh, it was pretty cool to, to get along with something that was a bit odd and different, you know, back then for the old Formula Extreme stuff. I, I had some good success with that thing. Um, the ZX-10 in 04, 05, which is when it came back, was not my bike. And I did, I, I mean, Richard did a lot to make it feel like mine, and I learned a lot of things that helped me later in my career, but I, it was a really difficult bike for me. And I, I really struggled to, I feel like, get a lot out of those years of my career. Um, but there's a few that stand out. Like, a big one was uh, in 1999, in Formula Extreme, we ran these uh, old uh, the the GSXR 750s board and stroke to 840s, and had PM wheels, Olin suspension. Uh, we had the uh, adjustable transmissions from World Superbike. We had the dry brake, in, or the excuse me, not the dry brake, the dry clutch from the World Superbike team. It was still carbureted, but just a cool motorcycle. It was so much fun to ride. And then the, that old, like the big mailbox things, GSXR 600s, they're what put me on the map, honestly. Like those bikes put me on the map. What about like, and, and you know, there's, you got the US series that's bringing out, you got Moto America bringing back or actually bringing forward a bagger series, what would you see, like, as, as far as what would be interesting to bring back into racing to make it a little bit more mainstream? Would it be, like, a two-stroke, or would it be a certain kind of uh, of motorcycle that you, you would like to see come back and maybe possibly, you know, be competitive? I don't see any of that stuff as the way to go, you know? I'm a, I'm a strong believer. Uh, I, I'm, I, I actually, though I understand that they're affordable and, all these things that they're out there, they're cheap, uh, cheap to race this. Now, I'm not a fan of the of the 400s, 300s, and 400s. It's not really, I don't think it's teaching good habits for racing. Um, I felt like the 600 was kind of the perfect motorcycle, personally. So if it were me, we would put a lot of focus on 600 Super Sport and on Superbike and maybe a stock 1,000. Um, and you would have a big gulf between stock thousand and superbike. Stock thousand should be raced on DOTs um, with a very simple motorcycle versus superbike, which is a true superbike, which we have right now. Stock thousands riding on the same tires as superbike and all these things. I mean, back in the day, seven fifty super sport didn't compete with 750 super bikes and now a super a thousand super stock bike can damn near compete with super bike they're, they're that good but there's other things that used to be done formula extreme bikes back in the day were unlimited 1000s versus a super bike which was a modified 750 you know but the works machines the tires all the good stuff went to the super bikes not to the stock thousand or not to the formula extreme class so they were always a bit harder to ride but I think the 600 is like still the, the best and most perfect learning platform. And so it's, it's killing me to watch them go away because I just thought it, it covered all the bases and teaching the lessons needed to be successful as a road racer. Josh, you kind of mentioned, you know, that the 300 and the 400 class, you know, it teaches a lot of bad habits. I know yet because you fundamentally have to ride the motorcycles completely different than you would, you know, mm -hmm. the 600. So then what would be a good, a good, pipeline what would you know bsb has the moto they have a moto 2 and so does i think cev they use a they use a moto 2 base before they go yeah, into super yeah, but that's, you know that's you... still that's still 600s right i mean they're still right. 600 racing and the, the hard part is you know 300s are a bad substitute to me for 125s the problem is that they're just readily available with the technology that's out there, the grip that they have, and the lack of power, um, these bikes are wide open so much, leaned over so much. The brake zone is so small that you can't actually learn much about racing. When everything has to be a desperate maneuver that you almost have to bump somebody out of the way. And we're expecting 
the the hardest racing there could possibly be on the track we're expecting the youngest kids to have the most composure to do that <laughs> you know what i mean i, I, I mean you're not you. putting a superbike missile in front of them but superbikes all spread out for different reasons and you have to learn to exploit an advantage now i understand that being cutthroat teaches them a lot because nowadays it seems to be that there's a lot less racing experience than what I got coming through the through the way. You get a lot more riding experience, and a lot more guys can go pretty well and ride to a certain level, but they don't learn how to race incredibly well. They learn how to go fast, but they don't know how to compete well. Well, just to cut to the chase, like with MotoGP, you see winglets on bikes, all this added electronics. I think this is the way to go should you go should racing be more embraced and more high-tech more electronic additives to, to to racing you know or maybe less what, what's like your view with the current i guess technology that's being applied to just you know a moto gp spec bike world super bike you know down the line the manufacturers go racing so that they can show their new technology and also so that they can have a testing ground for what comes in our new production machines in the future so taking it away i think is honestly the wrong way to go um it's just it's a part of racing and growth and especially for our sport which relies so heavily on manufacturer participation so nascar they came out with an identical car for every brand of everything in the world they're all exactly the same and they get sponsorship from all these different companies because all they are is a rolling billboard on identical cars. And any given weekend, any one of those cars can get to the front. Motorcycle racing, where you're showcasing the marketing and the values of how this bike is different than the other bikes, isn't going to work that way. So, I mean, I don't think you can take the technology out of racing if you want the manufacturers to carry the series. If we want to go into stock bike racing which was the attempt of DMG in the past. We saw how well that went. You ran off the core fans, you ran off the manufacturers, and you couldn't bring in the new people, and you had nothing left. You know, I, this kid's like 40 pounds, dude. Oh, you so can he's say like it, on my ribs. Why, it's, it's good, though. It's good training right there. But, but my, my thing is... You I'm know, not a racer like, anymore. Formula One did this years ago where they had like a curse system. They had little electronics mixed in. It was almost like a hybrid gasoline electronic kind of system where you can get power back from the brakes and whatnot. Would that be something that you'd kind of look forward to seeing motorcycle racing and technology, you know, kind of embraced as far as electric and gasoline powered? Or you just want to see it just, be just, just kind of gas powered, you know, kind of racing? F1 is currently V6 hybrids. So, I mean, and they're accelerating just so fast, <laughs> you know, like they're, they're breaking track records. So technology is an amazing thing, you know. Um, it, this a curse system was actually used in 125 Grand Prix, mm -hmm. and I think they took it back. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how they were using that power, but they were collecting power off the brakes um, to run the ignition or whatever they were doing with it, and they had a curse system involved in it. So, I, I mean, I think it's it's going to be the future. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I do think that it's coming. Now the two-parter. And again, I say this because we're all in quarantine. We're all kind of chomping at the bit to get the hell outside and see something. What do you think the next step is for the, the evolution of racing? Is it fanless? Is it just go to the track and minimize crew, press only, and just you know watch it from the comfort of your living room? What is, what is your opinion? You know, as far as the next steps, what do you think it's going to do to get get things in motion? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the way to go. I mean, I think it's a way to go. I mean, we have to get the sport out there. We have to get it out to people. Um. The, there's a there's a few fundamental hard things about motorcycle road racing. One is the U.S. is a big country. We have a ten race series, so everybody likes to talk about BSB. Look at that little belly. Everybody likes to talk about BSB. The hard part about BSB is every fan of motorcycle racing in the entire country of England can travel to every single race and drive four hours. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the furthest so, one away is four hours away from the southernmost part of England. Yeah, here in the U.S., you have to take vacation to travel to the one event you're going to get to go to or two events in your part of the country. And if you're in the West coast, you know, the next step is maybe go into virtual reality where you can put on a set of goggles and watch it from the comfort of your living room. You know, (laughs) look at this. Hey Hawk. (laughs) Say hi. Say hi buddy. buddy. That's who we're talking to. Say hi. Little man with the ACDC shirt. You got to respect the shirt. You got to respect. He he picks it most mornings. He's like, I want my blue ACDC shirt. That's okay. awesome. Question before we got, oh, I, I got distracted about the whole helmet thing. Corey mentioned something about the Jolly Roger. You know, where, where did you get the Jolly Roger inspired theme going? And sorry to hijack that question from you, Corey. But no, that's all right. I, hey, man. That's the only think? thing I yeah. do not know about Josh. I, I know some things, but not that. It's a long story. So, 2006, I won the Formula Extreme Championship uh, at Arian Honda and Arai after several years with them, or I mean, I started my career with them, said, we're going to do a replica. So Rick Briggs and I, uh, Offbeat Productions, he had done the, the Nikki, uh, you remember the barbed wire helmet? He did the Tommy gun helmet. Like he did a lot of guys helmets, yeah. right? And he and I had been working together from the beginning. So he painted me up. We, we tried and sketched up all these different things, trying to come up with the right helmet. Right. And, Everything we drew up, everything he painted, or I looked at and was like, Mm-mm. and I crashed everything I had. <laughs> oh, so we were going to Miller for the second year, and I call Rick and I'm like, "Man, I'm I need help. I need a helmet." He's like, "What do you want me to do? All I have are like solid helmets. You know, I got a solid white helmets here." I go, "I go, man. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do." I don't care. We don't have a lot of time. I said, you know what? Paint it black. Put a big skull and crossbones on the side of it. Forget them. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't know what else to do. I need a helmet right now. This will be fun. And he said, he's a tattoo artist. You know what I mean? He's like, dude, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, bring it on. I'm not scared. So he did it. And I didn't even get to see it. It showed up at Utah. And Bruce Porter pulls it out of the bag preps it and when i go to get it he goes this is the coolest helmet i've ever seen nice and i go what are you talking about you know and i remember i wore it and i i drafted by chaz on the attack bike going up the front straightaway and we were going you know it, the, the front straightaway at miller felt like days especially on the 600 so we're just riding next to each other looking at each other tucked in and he was like dude it was so weird seeing you with that helmet the big skull and crossbones staring at me you know because it was pretty rare to see something like that at that time you know but it ended up they they were like dude we love this helmet this is the one this is it and i'm like seriously and then because it was so you know just like kind of plain and fit anything it ended up being one of their best sellers ever (laughs) what started as a a ended up being like this (laughs) this gym you know, and, and went through like three revisions. You know, we ended up doing another. We went from the the, the uh, gloss one to the to the flat black one, and then we put the uh, the sprockets over it. And that's I'm like, I thought I know this guy. I mean, they call him the Mississippi Madman. I'm like, I guess he's in the pirates. I don't know. Richard Chambers from he he said I looked like a pirate once at Daytona. I don't know if you ever heard him. You know him and. <laughs> Chris Carter used to talk at Daytona on the thing and like, oh, he's a demon on the brakes. He just looks like a pirate. (laughs) 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 So it kind of went with the theme. Yeah. And and, and that's the thing is like, you know, the kind of segue into, you know, kind of working together. I, I started working with you, I think in 2014, you pulled me into, to work with Yamaha. Corey and I started working together back in 2000. How was it? Uh, well, we met in 2012, but I think we didn't start working together until 2016. Yeah, we've always borrowed off each other's stuff, but yeah, 16 was the first year we actually like worked together. That was with Moto America. Now, the, to, to segue to you, Corey, is that you got to, you know, and you have been working with Josh quite a lot. Do you want to talk about your, your latest project and what, you're, what you guys are involved in? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
to much as Josh can correct me or you know whatnot, but he, you know, the whole point was is that they were trying to get ready to do the Daytona 200 again, you know, and so flew into Barber to meet up with Josh and Melissa and the the team down at Barber. And, you know, just kind of shoot this whole, like, hey, you know, road to, in, in our initial plot and scheme, it was always to kind of do this road to 200. And now it's more morphed into, as you get, saw in the first video, it's hanging with the Hayes family. And it's just more, it, it's one of those things because of the long format that we were talking about, that when everything started changing, when we got to Daytona and then they ended up canceling Daytona, you know, what do we do with this footage? What do we do with all this stuff? So you know with the help of yamaha you know we've kind of crafted this more into the hanging with the hayes family as opposed to like the road to 200 because you know josh was you know leading everything up in those first two practice sessions for yeah. the most part i was I, I was feeling strong i was in the mix and you know i mean way ahead of where i had been last year so yeah so the whole point of the story brian really is it, it was supposed to be this big thing with you know leading towards you know Josh and MP13, you know, doing this Daytona 200, and it's really kind of morphed into this more. Here's the family, and here's what it's really like to travel with, you know, the family of the Hayes's. Where where could you see this? What's well, going to be playing on? So the first video is already out. That came out, I think, last week. Um, the second video is due out this week sometime. We're, you know, we've got a, a couple more to tease across, but I got an email this afternoon, so that'll be out. And I know Josh is. Josh is sharing them out, but it's coming out through Yamaha, so it's coming through their official channels. Oh, I I, uh, <laughs> I got to really know Josh in 2014, and I just realized he's he's a he's a character. Like, you know, really good on camera, but man, when he's off camera and he wants to go after you, he doesn't let up. <laughs> and oh, here we go. Yeah. And no, no, this is this has got to be talked about because I swear to God, like, I've gotten shit. And then I've gotten Josh Hay shit. You know, I, I have been, you know, outside of Moto America, I, I've covered, you know, different various sports. And, you know, I, I get a lot of, you know, who the fuck are you? What do, what do you want? You know, those kind of, kind of, but with Mr. Hayes over here, I get a rash in a shit. Like, no, when I get a request, when I get a request, my first question is, who's it for? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's like Sean Bice. You know, he's like, oh, Brian Nitto. And I'd be like, yeah, tell him no. <laughs> I'll do it. Just tell him no. <laughs> and the worst part is I would hear him say this. Like, it wouldn't be like, you know, like without an ears reach. I'm just like, God damn it. No, it was with intent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Looking right at you. Every, every time. Just, every time. Yeah. And, and, you know, as much as I love the Joker, there are times where I'm like, I just got to get shit done. I just got to get this recorded get this the hell out the door, do things. But no, Josh is like, fuck you, buddy. You're going to hold on for the ride. You're just, you're, you're in, in it to win it. And I mean, rip me apart. And so I got a little sample that I, I you know, discussed. And we, oh, we're going to show the video. Oh, we, oh, we yeah. have to. We have to. Oh, we have okay. to. It's, You've seen this, Corey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, okay. yeah. So I've it, seen it probably more times This went to have. HR, right? Yeah, yeah, well, went... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. For the record, f***ing Brian Nitto that wanker from the northeast new york well after a weekend like we've had it <laughs> go ahead do you know brian our producer that guy from new york i hate dealing with that guy so no more interviews Again. with him okay <laughs> new yorkers probably hangs out on the shore or wherever yeah. it is they go I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's not in, easy in, Jersey. In, your, in your community of pedophiles and <laughs> I'm, I'm respected by the other peder asses in my community <laughs> seriously dude eight year olds i mean i just get ripped apart i just get so ripped apart i'm like holy shit this 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 guy who just destroyed me within seconds and i'm like i could do nothing about it that was kind of the fun of being the star <laughs> yeah, part of the fun what could you do i used to like dead leg all my crew and stuff because they couldn't hit me back <laughs> i don't i don't play that game anymore <laughs> has there ever been like an interview that you're just like besides with me and i know the answer has there ever been an interview where you're just like no nah, whitey and i we had a few fun things i remember one time uh, i was on a good run 
of like pole position in Formula Extreme, and he was like at Utah, and he's like, "Oh, Josh Hayes on the pole again, seventh time this season." Josh, <laughs> you love the pole, don't you? <laughs> you know, I was like, "Well, thanks, Greg. I like the box better, <laughs> but I'll take it." And, it. and that was on live. That was on on air. Um, and then, but there were, the best ones were there were a handful of like. Uh, with Greg, this happened a, a lot more than you'd think. He's quite the gamer, dude. I'm actually pretty proud of the guy. I whacked him in the ball so hard, so many times while being interviewed when he was pit reporting. Like, you know, he'd come up and be like, Josh, tell me about the race. I'm like, oh, Greg, whack under the <laughs> camera, and I'd nail him. And he would hold that thing so steady when he'd have that microphone out there, head down, crying while I was talking. It was hard for me to keep my face straight most of the time. <laughs> now, now, Corey, working with Josh, uh, you know, have you had the luxury? You know, obviously, you guys were tight quarters as far as you know being with the team, him and Melissa. What, what experiences could you could you share that were? Got to be honest, I uh, none. I have none of those <laughs> negative experiences. <laughs> hey, Josh there's a big difference here. There's a big difference here. He's caught me at a different time in my life and career where I'm working to get him paid, and I need him to show up every time. You were doing your job. <laughs> you were at my mercy. So, <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun because, yeah, I think it's more. I think he needs me. <laughs> so <Yeah. he's> not... <laughs> I know I was the way. But apparently, Brian has something that I didn't know about. Where I did catch you at one time. Oh yeah, yeah, but I don't even rem- I don't even remember this. Oh, he just oh, yeah, he told yeah. me about it. Oh, I got. Do you this. have that picture? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, we got this. Hold on. I need right. to see this picture. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah, oh, that might happen. It is. Yeah, that okay. totally happened. That, yeah, I think that might and, have and 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 a fresh face, <laughs> Corey enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, this what I, what cracks me up about this photo is you know I was still kind of fanboying out. This was probably twelve or thirteen. I think and, it was twelve. Twelve. Yeah, yeah you, you've probably gotten over that. <laughs> and I was, and I was, and I was like, "That's motherfucking Josh Hayes coming up. Get my photo." And I didn't realize you were going to teabag me. Like, and and that's where that that is the time frame where I got to know Josh a little bit more and and regretful, regretful of these uh, moments because on. whenever you were bent over or something, that that was that was him. I dare you. Kind of just, I dare you. Yeah, you know, uh, I and, worked I worked around Rick Hobbs and and a lot of guys from the South for a long time. He's Canadian, <laughs> so he's his hopes and dreams are don't matter anyway. He's not a person. He's Canadian. He has no soul. <laughs> the thing is, I don't want to let the the, the cat out in the bag with your Yamaha videos, but you know, and again, answer as you may, but. What's it like to go down to Daytona and just, you know, you, you can't pass go. The, the, everything was canceled. Now they're talking about resuming back in October. What, what does it feel like, you know, to, to I guess, go through the motions again? What, what's, what's going on? I mean, again, I don't want to steal thunder from your video. I don't know if it captured but. You can't. My video is too damn hot. <laughs> you can say whatever it, you want. It's that hot. <laughs> it's that hot. He can put the visual with it. So, you know, from here, yeah. you're just getting some blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, I don't know. Right now, the whole the whole thing is that it's not an easy answer. You know, whenever they sent us home and said, okay, we're going to postpone it to October, so many of us were in so deep to make that happen. I mean, it was $2,000 in diesel fuel to drive there and back. So, like, I, I don't know. They didn't pay out any of the purse money for for uh qualifying or anything so for some of us on the west coast that made these huge investments if we can't recoup it somehow there's no way we can make that drive again in october because it's fun so i mean and that's preserving everything that we had set up and built to be ready for that if i race this bike anywhere else it's not legal it's only good for daytona without changing the internals into different forks without taking all the quick change stuff off and a different gas tank a different engine i got to preserve that engine we have an enormous amount of money invested in that engine for that race only. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, uh, you know, with everything businesses shutting down and all these government, you know, kind of funds or grants set up, is there any way the race community or a race team could get some type of government, you know, loan or some type of grant? Is there anything to be Loans applied? you have to pay back. 
Yeah. Well, no, I mean, or, or grants or something small business. I mean, is there something to I, I don't keep, know. you know, things? I, don't know. I think that uh, Moto America had put out some stuff saying that they could get, you know, there was some kind of things for certain types of teams and this and that. But, I mean, I'm not a pro racer anymore. I'm a, I'm a coach. Like, I'm a lot of other things. I'm a, I'm a garden boy right now is what I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you know like may maybe there is stuff out there and, and usually i have to trust on my very smart wife to be on top of that stuff that's why she married me i'm a good uh, motorbike racer well talking about coaching i mean as a coach you know the, the season kind of got a little bit stalled and I'm, I'm, I'm shifting gears here you know you got joe roberts who started off pretty strong what what do you think is your kind of opinion on 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 a joe roberts you know running an american you know running overseas do you think it started off promising for him you know as a coach what do you what do you think and to see him have the turnaround he had and do what he did at Qatar I mean he started at Jerez he was fast at Jerez goes to the Qatar test he's fast there and then to finish it and put together three more days at that race is great the worst thing that could have possibly happened has happened now he's going to sit stagnant for two or three months before he gets to go and test his medal again rather than taking a confidence high and running with it so man i i hope him and john the best i hope they can get and keep riding at a high level and and that this is not a fluke that this is just the beginnings of what joe is capable of doing i've had joe around the house here quite a bit he's come and hung out with us and stayed with us for a couple of months and rode motocross and dirt track in the backyard and all those fun things and i i really hope good things for joe who do you feel like racer this year again if and when the season starts that was kind of going under the radar that you feel like uh and again maybe if you have that intel maybe if you train with them who's the rider to watch you know to keep an eye on you know up and coming like who's somebody that's going to be a, a, a big name pretty pretty soon we're talking young guys or even young guys, guys yeah young, just young guys yeah. young guys that you've noticed that you've seen firsthand you know either through training or at the track last year who do you think like I, wow they're gonna I like be somebody to reckon with I like Kevin Olmedo. Yeah, I think he's one of my favorites. He was exciting on the little bike. I got to do a couple laps with him at Barber on the 600, and like, man, just big smile on his face and just having a good time. Very talented. Makes not afraid of making mistakes. Like, I think he's very exciting. He's someone I would like to work with. I think he's someone Melissa would like to work with. Like, I just like what I see over there. You know, just kind of at the track last year, just. You know, doing what you've been doing, you know, covering Daytona has kind of caught you at the corner of your eye. Who do you feel like is? You know, I think when it comes to road racing, I don't know, I'm a little bit out of it last year. You know, I spent my time, uh, you know, in the dirt. So I got a couple dirt trackers that I pretty much noticed. But when it comes to the, when it comes to road bike, I don't know. I mean, I've always been a fan of Andrew Lee. I know he's not a young guy, but, you know, he's somebody, you know, he's a two-time, you know, Superstock 1000 champion. And not even being considered for rides in superbike is just extremely odd to me so it, it is there's no rides to be had i mean exactly that's the problem bobby bobby got what he got after mm -hmm. winning a 600 championship and he barely got that and you got right. a guy like heron who's going from being a factory rider for so many years to to the shyby deal and, and basically working his way back there, there's nowhere to go yeah so like it's it's really tough but you know, one thing Corey hasn't, you know, he, he's been around for both of my J-Force camps. If you ever want to ask somebody about my coaching, he's probably a good one that can tell you a bit about coaching, the people I'm working with and what he's seeing from them over the course of the week. Because he got to be pretty intimate with it right up in the middle of it and seeing me yelling at the guys and all kinds of good stuff. You know, I, I'm just kind of curious about how he feels about coaching because, you know, some people – they never stop, you know, they, they constantly have to be competitive, you know, and I'm yeah, kind of so curious of, of, of what that feels like, you know, to now take on that role and maybe a little bit less on the bike. Well, you know, I think when it comes to Josh and I'm not going to talk shit about him, I mean, he's not on the phone, but I would say it to his face too, but you know, he's, you, you saw it too, before we kind of stepped out of the paddock for about a season or so, you know, he's always been up talking with the junior cup kids. I know he's got a, you he just mentioned his issue with the, the junior series, but the kids themselves, you know, he was always up there talking, you know, he had like, you know, it was like uncle happy campfire time, you know, or he was always had the, the junior cup kids, the KTM cup kids sitting around telling stories and coaching the kids in mass. And so when you see him actually 
at his camp working with kids. And so, for an example, um, Alexander Dumas, right? Uh, Alex Dumas. Uh, you know, he's making the shift this year from the 600s to the 1000 uh, super stock and seeing him at the camp and seeing how Josh, you know, it, it's, it's hard sometimes because what he's talking about with these racer kids is they just, they're all go and then they don't want to listen, but you can see the effects of the, of the students who do listen and who do take the word of a four time champ, somebody who's been there and watch them over the course of a week. Because you know Josh will put them through the paces on the T on the TTRs to the WRs on the you know supermoto side to you know tennis and golf, but to see the, how these kids evolve and then respond to the coaching is huge. It's huge, and it, it, to me, it looks like Josh is where he needs to be at this point in his career. You know, we always want to say, hey, you know, somebody can race until the you know they're in their fifties, but seeing Josh where he is right now in the role of a coach is fantastic. I think. And I think the students, you know, speak for it too. Would you consider Josh Hayes the Tom Brady of, of U.S. motorsport? Would you consider, would you go that far? I would say he's more of a Doug Flutie. He's definitely a Doug Flutie. <laughs> he must not have a Brett, he's, he's more of a Brett Farva. I don't, I don't know who Doug Flutie is. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I figured that was a close to a floozy joke or something. Man, Doug Flutie. Sorry. Oh, also had to grab a Dr. Nope. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. There it That's is. the Mississippi coming right back at you. <laughs> Hometown Slidell. Yeah, yeah so, so so let's let's talk about some things. Some things. I know you're from Mississippi, but who was the first one to coin you with the Mississippi madman? You don't I know. Don't know. Was I that Greg White it. after you tagged him in the nuts or no, something? No, <laughs> no, it was it was more like a Richard Chambers, somebody like that. Yeah. Mm. Um the Hurricane Hayes, Mississippi Madman. I heard I had the Mississippi mudslide for a while. <laughs> even though there's no hills, even though there's no hills to have a mudslide on, um, <laughs> yeah. you know. One thing that you mentioned, you know, you and this was I found I, I knew this. I mean, I knew this. I just didn't know how the, uh, intensive it was. But you mentioned, you know, you and Greg White used to be competitive and race. You know, you guys kind of <laughs> went through mm. went through the pace. Wait a second. Wait a second. You, you know, took that way too far. With oh, I, I, took, I took it too far? Okay. <laughs> so it the be competitive here. part. That, that's where you went too far was the big Okay. Well, part. I got I to gotta bring him on eventually because I got I to gotta get his, his two cents with this. But, you know, you mentioned, you know, to me about, you know, uh, being involved in a lot of different series all at once. Is it because it, it made sense to be involved and to be that competitive? Or was that the, and I say this because, of, you know, more of budget and budget racing. Was it, did it make more sense to be involved in certain series as far as the purse and certain things like that? Or were you just kind of looking to be a guy was, that come and conquer and, and, and do what's necessary, you know? It was survival in club racing in those days. In that day, factory contingency was prevalent. And so when I did my deal with John Ulrich, my very first one in 1996, he, gave, he loaned to me a GSX-R 750 and a GSX-R 1100. Suzuki paid two classes for each bike. 500 bucks at a club race to win. So I could make $2,000 a weekend if I could win four races. So that determined where I was going racing now. So I, I picked races in between and I chased contingency money. So I raced FUSA, ASRA, WERA regional stuff, WERA national stuff, endurance races, CMRA, like whatever was local that I could get to that was paying a little bit of money. I was going to chase it and try to make some. I remember I did one AMA national and, and it was Daytona of all things because a buddy called me and he's like, dude, you got to do Daytona. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to Daytona. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard with a brand new stock motorcycle in March. I'm not going to Daytona. It's, the, the tires are specific to that. It's all this stuff. He's like, I'll pay for everything. And I go, okay, it's going to be, you know, six sets of tires. It's going to be this much entry fee, this much for room. He, he paid the bill. I got my butt kicked because I wasn't prepared to go do that yet. But, you know, it was that kind of deal. I, it was just survival at that time of where what you did to make it in racing. I needed experience. I needed to race. And I had to pay for things along the way. Now, do you feel because you've been through the sport with the highs and lows that it's it's normal? You know, it's just like just the daily living, just the economy of things that – 
there are going to be some, you know, uphill struggles and there's going to be some times where, you know, you the, the the sport is financially back and things are a little bit better. Do you do you feel that, you know, motorsports is kind of like this or do you feel that there's really something out there that needs to take it to the next level because it I don't know, it, it it's not, you know, surviving or or uh I, I certain think, things like like what what, what I do you think mean? you found the one question <laughs> I think you found the one question I don't want to answer. Okay. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you have hit the hot button for me. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to. It's just it's a it, it's hard it's hard for me to say it. I am watching our sport die, and it's killing me because I love it so much. Um, I I I don't think or can't remember it ever being like this. Not I, I don't know the history of our sport, but I don't know how it recovers from this this is the entertainment industry and the way entertainment is changing we're not keeping up a sport sports in general other than soccer <laughs> are not keeping up i mean i don't I, I don't i don't think major league baseball came back from from their bad time to the level that they yeah. were but they're doing okay again i mean mm. but I, I I don't know how we get people back into motorsports. If we don't get them to go buy motorcycles, it just doesn't matter what we do. Where we are fighting and scrapping to put on a good show. That we have to figure out how to do. How do we well, make this entertaining to people? And to me, the big part of that is education. And, and, and that's the thing. is like it, it is a fine line of entertainment. And I was saying something ridiculous to Corey, and, and, and no, I didn't no, ingest man. anything, any edibles or drink. Or I haven't been drinking, although I should, although <laughs> I haven't had a drop during quarantine. But on that note, you know, I envisioned, you know, nowadays we'd have like almost like Tron light cycles, some type of presence, some type of a little bit of flash when it comes to the track is, you know, and again, to be somewhat realistic, do you think maybe like nighttime racing, you know, might be the way to go since if fans can't make it in this day, maybe we should race at night. Maybe it's a little bit more dynamic. I, I don't know. You know, what's what's what do you think might be the latest draw? You know, maybe is it doing more? actual road racing events maybe like time trial racing in the united states you know what do you think might cultivate it you know you know for me motorcycle road racing we kind of started down this road earlier but it's a little hard to spectate anyway not only do you have to travel all over the country road racing tracks are yeah. typically not very spectator friendly and if fa a lot of fans don't show up it's hard to get people to spend money on jumbotrons and place them strategically around the trace track so you can see what's happening on the other side of the track while you're watching this cool part you know you want to watch the exciting sections but you want to know what's happening on the rest of the track so th that's a big difference with supercross where you can sit up in a stadium and see the whole racetrack see all the excitement going on the other thing they do real good is they put on a four-hour show and if we focused rather than on a three-day weekend selling tickets and maybe focused on let's say noon to five an opening ceremonies and a race on the hour four great races and made it excuse me easily more accessible to families it's really hard i think let's use new jersey as a good example right we go to new jersey um let's say we do all this great advertising it's all over the place right if it were uh, a, a local rodeo and it was twenty dollars to park and come in and see the rodeo and people have never gone to the rodeo before a guy with a family and three kids might go hey there's a rodeo going on this weekend it's cheap let's go check it out see what it's like see what it's about motorcycle racing if they want to come to a moto america event on sunday afternoon because motorcycle races are happening with a man his wife and three kids <clears throat> it's going to cost them 250 dollars to come see something they've never seen before they're not going to spend that money they're not even going to give it a chance You've been involved in quite a lot, you know, and especially stuff that, uh, that's that been, you know, overseas. And what what is the one event, what is the one experience that you had that kept you up, that, that really kind of, you know, you thought about for nights on end, like, you know, you, you got a little bit of that, that nervous energy before you, you go out on the track. Was it anything like, you know, anything that was, you, you were racing in Macau, anything that kind of stands out of like that, that moment? 
Uh, probably the, the only time I can remember really wanting to pee my pants nervous was, uh, it, when I did the MotoGP race and, uh, it was absolutely pissing down rain before first practice. And I mean, just a downpour. And everybody talked about how bad the track was in the wet, which is the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard coming from America where we can't have one surface around the whole racetrack. So here I am. I'm about to go out on a MotoGP bike for the first time ever on a Valencia, which I don't know, uh, on Bridgestone rain tires, which I've never ridden on before. And it is dumping rain. So I'm in the garage. I've got my suit on and I'm just like, all right, here we go. They roll the doors open and it's like, it looks dark outside. It's so overcast and raining so hard. And there are, now, in Moto, America, in Moto America, whatever, we typically have four or five photographers, maybe. There were 40 photographers standing there waiting for the garage door to go up so they could take a picture of me. That, I, I was about ready to pee my pants when I saw that. Like, seriously, the whole world gets to see me look like an idiot. I've seen you, you know, behind the scenes. You're pretty damn cool under pressure. And I got to say, it's, it's you, you got a good support system around you. And when I, when I started kind of... Being aware of you and, and, and Yamaha, you know, I, I, I realized you're only as good as the people surrounding you. And, and really, they were helping you, you know, elevate your, 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 your game each and every year with your championships wins. But with that in mind, I, I, I've seen you ride and race with different teammates. What, what was the one teammate or one team that really kind of took you and brought your, your, your game to the next level where you really kind of learned and absorbed and, and, and executed it, you know, with your, your riding style or just the way you train, whatever your program is? What, what's that one key factor? Was it a person? Was it a teammate? There, there are two that kind of stand out, uh, I think, of, of just like memories pretty, pretty early in my career. Uh, Grant Lopez. Um, when I started racing in where club racing, Grant Lopez lived in Mobile, Alabama, 45 minutes down the road. So I drove to his house, jumped in a truck with him. I had only barely met him. And then we traveled off to all the where net where races together in the Southeast in, in 1994. And so he kind of taught me the ropes about racing and he was a, he was pretty darn good racer himself. So I, I had somebody who was, he, he was he was his own kind of person. He was very unique in, in his demeanor and the way he carried himself. But it's not so much like a personality thing that rubbed off, but just like we had a lot of fun. We traveled the country together, and he kind of helped keep me going when I was still in very, very, very early stages of figuring it out. And then uh, I had I had you know a lot of good teammates. I've been really really pretty lucky. Um, I would say uh, in 2000, when I moved up to the Aryan Racing team and replaced Nikki Hayden at Aryan Racing when he went to the factory team with Miguel, I was Curtis Roberts' teammate. And uh, for for all the things that Curtis is and isn't, man, you know what? I got to see some some. I, I knew the bike he was riding. And I got to, to see some truly amazing things happen. And that guy do some just incredible things in 2000 on that motorcycle. And I learned a lot about just like, it's not always perfect, but you just hunker down and you go out there and you, and you make things happen. And, you know, I, I got to see him be tortured in a lot of ways <laughs> like of, of not having his own identity every every person in line at an autograph session how's your brother how's your dad call him kenny like all these just things it just it never ended it never ended. It didn't matter what he did what he accomplished he always had to answer questions about his family more than himself and mm -hmm. i think it ate him alive but man when it got to the business of it I mean, I got to see that guy take it to Matt Maladin, Nikki, like all those guys at one time or another. He was a he was a weapon, man. That guy, he could do some amazing things, and and it's sad that we couldn't keep his character around our paddock longer, because I think he was uh, good for our series and our sport. With, with that in mind, who do you, who do you feel like is the character in the U.S. paddock? You know, who who is got a little bit of everything? You know, where it's got a little bit of old school, but a little bit of new school. 
I know you've been training some people, but you know, I'm kind of curious of who you who you're uh, you think it is going to be. You know, the, I know you mentioned earlier it's going to be next to latest and greatest young guys, but who is kind of the the, the who's like the, like <clears throat> the last three of like the generation before were like me, Larry, and Roger, and when we were gone. That's kind of it. This is a new generation, and there was a big jump from one to the next because there was a lot of guys in that 2009 and 10 area that didn't phase out. They just left and didn't come back, and they didn't even come around the track. So all those stories, like all those things are just lost forever. And, you know, I would tell these stories to guys like Cameron Bobby, and they'd be like, what? That really happened? You know, and and there's the the – I mean, when I when I had to stop racing, what a year before Roger, like I was forty two and my oldest teammate was twenty five, and it's it's been such a huge swing. You know, even even guys that have been there a decade are now they're really still kind of the new generation, and they just communicate different. They their social skills are different. They don't have the same relationships they don't get in rvs and travel together around to the races like a traveling circus it's a lot more separated and so it's funny because like bobier's pretty funny kid he has trouble getting it across on camera i think he's afraid of looking silly um garrett gerloff was a bit the same they would try to kind of go with it a little bit bobby fong has got he is one of the funniest people i know but you just can't get that same thing across because he can't figure out how to do it without being dirty bob <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah and so it's like i know there's some great personalities out there we're just not getting to see them we're getting more of the old school motocross uh reading the sponsor list from the from the pit board off to the side you know and oh, they they but it's it is but you know what there's just too much pressure to be the all-american kid right now for survival that, I agree with you. You know, you get a you get a Danny Eslick or somebody like that, and you screw up, and you're too short for this for this world, too short for this uh, for to stay in your sport. And and now, you know, things are more public now than what they used to be. You can't go to the bar afterwards and do something because somebody's going to have video on their phone of you doing it. Everybody's got a cell phone with a camera in their hand, and and it's just all these companies where when we're begging people to come spend money in our series, even though that stuff's gold because it's news, they can't have that character represent their business. Right. Yeah. Now 22. Yeah, it is a catch 22. And I, and I mean, you, you mentioned <clears throat> earlier, you know, having to, you know, the way of life was bouncing between a different series. And now, you know, it, it, it seems, you know, like riders are in a little bit more manufactured. They don't have, I, you know, and I don't want to say they don't have it as tough, but it just seems it's a little bit more. There is no factory contingency money. You can't go race. And, and there were guys, like I remember uh, Robert Jensen, uh, uh, Billy Eisenacher, Brian Stokes, making a living, making six big years riding club races on motorcycles because of Yamaha and Suzuki and Honda contingency. Kawasaki continues they could go around and make money at the races and that's how they survived in racing and but the other thing that the companies did good in doing that was you had to be on the current or previous year so every two years you had to buy a new motorcycle so you had people buying motorcycles because they were going to go race them in the local stuff sorry this little bright yellow bird just come and landed about 10 feet from me by the swimming pool caught me off guard <laughs> no, it's all good. And and that's the thing is I, I, I like I like this Josh. I like Josh. He's relaxed, you know, and again, it's it's not in racing leathers, you know. It's is this is the new Josh over here. He seemed pretty relaxed when he was talking shit to you, so <laughs> in the no, video no, you no, showed no, yeah. in his environment, you know. And that's the thing, is you ever get back uh you just know, try, back I'm just east? trying to keep the stomach convulsions down. Talking to Brian Nitto. Yeah. Okay. All right. Listen, <laughs> I I know deep down inside you, I'm your muse for both of you. So mm. the, you don't you don't mm. have to thank me mm. again. I, I inspire yeah. all. Can you, dude, 
you make it so easy for us. Look at that haircut. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a reason why I stick behind the camera. This is a first, all right? So I'm just I'm wondering right. how you have all these kids. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> 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 Clearly, it's not the money nor the looks. <laughs> <laughs> it's neither. Uh, you told her you're this great director. I, I thought <laughs> it, listen, my, <laughs> it's based on lies. I'm in movies. It, it is. It is totally based on lies. You know, we were we were just talking about something Corey and I worked on. We were working on a pilot, a little docu series about following. You know certain riders here in the United States, but uh, it it really hasn't transpired or gone anywhere. But uh, just just as an idea and a pilot. But what do you feel like? You know what would be a good kind of thing to to do as far as putting a spotlight on it? Would it be a a, a documentary following certain key individuals or just you know maybe a little bit more social media presence in the in the paddock uh you know what what do you think you know would you would you watch something long format as a documentary uh you know on road racing i don't see why not i like i like stuff like that you know um everybody's scared of presentation like i, I don't know you know, most uh, a lot of documentaries like here, here's here's some of the issue with it, right? Like I, Melissa and I were approached about about doing some kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm going again uh, about like a reality TV, and uh, I got it, thank you, buddy. <laughs> you had to confirm it. Um, Beautiful. And the the problem is that that you know life itself isn't dramatic enough people need to manufacture drama somehow and that's that's tough you know what i mean it's tough to get people to want to be involved with something that doesn't feel real unless they think they're going to be a star in hollywood or something yeah which we never had much interest in so we just wanted to go racing <laughs> but the stories are fantastic presentations the hard part getting the story out to people in the right way that they want to hear it so i mean i think it could happen and it could be good you know um but the, the, the other hard side of doing this with athletes i think is it's hard to get it, it's the rare athlete that'll give you the true feelings anyway the real story you know yeah. they uh athletes are so fragile in ego and self-confidence that a lot of times they won't tell you when it's really hard you know or when they're scared or all these different things so finding the right guy who's not afraid that people are going to take advantage of him for it then you know it's like yeah i'm scared but that doesn't mean that so and so is going to beat me <laughs> you know what i mean like, if they, it's really hard to get people that can handle all those different things that one can get one or he, one thing here or one thing there but it's sometimes that's too much it's hard even as a coach to get the real answer sometimes yeah but before you you know hop back on Corey and i were just literally talking about the exact thing that that true sense that pureness of of feeling genuine and feeling comfortable and and having that you know that that conveyed and, and documented you know but mm -hmm. you know it, it, it like you mentioned with, with reality tv you know when you were approached uh you know I, clearly, it, it, it never happened. Is it because of the fact that you just, again, like a little bit more privacy off the track, you know, because, again, family? Yeah, we weren't that interested in people being that invasive in our lives, you know. We we kind of decided for ourselves that even, you, you know, remember Road Racing World did all those cribbed articles for years, and they asked us and asked us and asked us, and I was just like, man, you know what? Like, I, I, want, I, want, I want this one thing. My house is my house, and I'm going to leave that out. I don't want to. Like I'm bragging, showing off things that I have, and I don't want to be judged for X, Y, or Z. You know what? This is mine, so I'm going to leave this out of it. And he, all right, let us do your barn, show your race shop. No, no, like my house is my house. Leave me alone. I'll give you anything else, <laughs> but you know, I, I've always tried to be honest, and that the the few things that you that you'll get, you know, and I, I've tried to do that throughout my career because I didn't feel like people could actually use it to hurt me. So interviews I, I was told i gave good interviews 
and I didn't read the list, but I tried to make sure I mentioned someone that was important to me in each each interview that I did. Fortunately, I got to do a lot of them, so I knew I would get them all in at some point. But I wasn't afraid to talk about it, and and it's like it's hard, even with I'm like, man, you know, like even though your competition pisses you off, you need to talk them up as good, because you're nothing if you don't beat good people. So if you say everybody shit and you win, then all you did was beat a pile of dog shit. You didn't do anything. Yeah. So you need to remember that you're racing against world-class racers, and you need to talk them up and be like, man, I, I feel lucky that I was able to get out there and beat these guys this way. And I know it's my job, and I work hard at it, but it's another thing to actually do it. And all, to, It's great to see all the preparation come to fruition. And it's okay also to say, shit, I hate losing. I hate losing to that guy. And I'm going to try to figure out how to beat him next time. Now, and, but it's really hard for people to give that real reaction. Now, you seem like you don't hold on to anger. You don't hold on to things, but you did mention something. Is, has there been that one rider where, or that one race that you just, you had that little bit of animosity, you just couldn't let go, and maybe it's taken years to, to let go. Has there been that one time <laughs> where you're just like, nah, nah, I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not cool right now, and you gotta, you, you know, you got you to walk it off. <laughs> It's not even animosity. It was just a, a, I was angry at myself. There, there are two performances that have really kind of got under my skin. Um, one was, was for a, a, it's a long story, host of reasons, but it involved Ben Bostrom winning at Laguna Seca. He was fastest qualified on pole. In the race, he made a mistake early on. I got to the lead. I had good pace, and I had a lead, and I made a few mistakes and kind of let him back in it, and he ended up beating me. And uh, I think it was the only race he won in the two years that we were both on Yamahas. You know, on the podium, you know, I, I was already like, I knew that this was his race. And so it, I knew it was going to be pretty special to figure out how to, how to dethrone him at, at Laguna Seca. And so when it hit, it, it, it was a gut punch. It hurt me because I had it, I had it in my hand and I let it slip away. And I couldn't come up with what I needed at the end to force the issue and make it happen. He did ride good. And yeah. on the podium, he was like, man, that's the best I've ever seen Josh ride. And I was just like, oh, you mother... <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that one was like, I, I lost sleep over losing that race. And, and because it was Ben and because this was a special place for Ben and all these things, it wasn't a, like Ben himself, his personality, his, his person, you know, he was, he was always fantastic to me. The other one that really set with me really badly was uh, there was a superbike race. I think it was 2011, and I'd gotten on a pretty good run, but I was battling with uh, Tommy Hayden, Blake Young, and Roger Hayden, and I was struggling, at, which was typically a real trap for me, and. I want to say on the first day, Blake and I battled, and he just beat me to the line, but it was close, and I got second. And the second day, I was in the front in the battle the whole race. Yeah. And I, I only had one move, which was after the back straightaway, you go off the right, over the top of the left, down into the next right, and I kept stuffing him there really hard. <laughs> and... And there were two kind of things that came from it. One was in he ended up winning the race, and, and Roger got me for third, and I ended up off the podium. And so I didn't make it. I, I debriefed for a long time with my crew, and whenever I was done, I was walking back up to the garages, and, and a couple of the journalists came out of there and said, man, Blake Young and, and Kevin Swamp said some pretty critical words for the way you came in the race. And I kind of laughed, you know, because I was like, I only had one move. And so you knew it was coming in that spot. I couldn't do anything anywhere else. Yeah. And I was like, and, and I remember going, well, yeah, you know, like I, I had to take my shot without like really taking a big shot. So I was just like, well, you know, now all of a sudden oh, during that race by winning, he took the, or the day before he took the points lead. So now he's got something to lose and he can't afford to have somebody riding like Blake Young around him now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now I was talking about Blake. And uh, may, maybe this, yeah, it might have been. I think it was a lab. So, but the other thing that really sat with me for a long, long, long time was I 
at, at one point, Roger got me, and I dropped back to fourth. And I was exhausted. I was tired. I'd bite these guys. I'd been losing a lot of races to Lake. And I'd been on pole every single race. I'd led the most laps of every race so far that year. I was in fourth place, and on the last lap, when we kind of went through the back roller coaster section, Roger opened the door, and I just wasn't sharp, and I, I missed my opportunity to take advantage of it and get myself on the podium. And I remember, I remember just going, man, like I gave this freebie away, and I was furious with myself for allowing it to happen. And it carried me through five more years because I remember going, you know what? Jim Roach, my crew chief, didn't deserve that. He worked too hard for me to give it away. And I could come up with a million excuses and say why he beat me. I could say, oh, man, I had a vibration in the tire. Oh, I slipped in here right when I'm not in the camera. Yeah, whatever. You know, I could come up with a yeah. thousand different things. I knew I let that thing get away, and it disgusted me. And it was funny because, like, I want to say a year later we were racing there, and I I raced it like a, a plus zero to Roger Hayden up my ass yeah, for two days. And at the end of the second race, I remember I'd been on like a seven-day run in 2012, and, and Roger was right there. I was exhausted. I had won seven in a row, and I remember thinking, I'm, I've still got plus zero, and we're about four laps to go. And I'm like, you know, I could ease up because we have a. I could see Roger's board, and we were like plus twelve after Roger. I'm like, I could ride in behind Roger, and nobody could say a thing to me. You know? Yeah. What could they say? I'm on this run. What What could they say, really? And I go, you know what? Like, Rochi, Steve, Jeff, Vito, those guys deserve better than that. I don't have to be better than I've been. If he beats me, he beats me. But I gotta at least do the same thing. A minute and a half, four times, six minutes. I've gutted through six minutes on my bicycle. I can do the same thing for six for for six minutes and four more laps. And and I did that. And by the last lap, he just started to drop back and couldn't quite hang on, and I managed to win the race. So it was a, a lesson that I learned that stuck with me for a long time. Now, Nothing for free, baby. Yeah, you beat I, me, you beat me. Nothing for free. Now, I, I feel like I might know this. But I don't want to assume because I'm always an ass in your eyes. So I would like to have you tell me what was the one race that you wish you never raced, that you just wished, you know what, if I got to delete that from my brain, that's the one. What, what's, what's the one race that you're just like, I wish it was out of my head? I don't know. Shit, no. I have to think back for a while. That, that one could take a while. I, I don't know. Because cause that's the thing is, I, I, I feel like, again, my presence when I started working with you in 2014 for Yamaha, I was the exact opposite of a, a lucky rabbit's foot. I was like a shit magnet. If anything weird could happen on the track, it did. And I remember Road America, you being on the track and lightning, you know, being taking place. I remember you being down at New Jersey Motorsports and it just downpoured. And you racing there, and that's how I'm like, I, I don't know. I've seen some pretty dicey situations that you've raced in, and I'm like, yeah, I wish I was never out there. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious of what, like, dicey situations you were just like, oh, shit, I should have never done that. No, I'm lucky yeah, I got to race on a turn. Keith McCarty was fantastic to work with, and he did, He said, if you don't like it, <laughs> you're a pro, man. You get to make your decision. The only thing that I, I can remember ever really like truly being angry about was the whole Road America debacle where they had declared it wet at the track all on slicks and they sent us out and when it downpoured they decided we declared it a wet race so they didn't stop it and I got to do like three laps of Road America on slicks and I never got out of third gear and won the race. That was <laughs> so, insane. Yeah, I had to, I had to watch, you know, Cameron crash twice and like all these guys, you know, Jason Carroll laying in the middle of the back straight away. Like it was an absolute disaster. And afterwards he's like, why did you put your hand up? I go, do you think I'm going to let go of the damn handlebars? Like, are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like in, in, in like the backstory, the guy should have, should have known. He knew better. He knew better. So it, it was just a, a shitty situation and, and like, that out of my control should have been handled differently. And, and the only thing I could have done differently is pull in off the track. 
And it, had it been just about me, I would have. But I I had a crew and a sponsors and a manufacturer to answer to. And I felt like I could. I, I, I had made the decision when it started raining and I was on slicks that I was finishing the race. I didn't care how slow I went. I didn't care if anybody beat me. Uh, at one point, like the second lap that it was wet, a Canadian guy on a BMW came ripping by me on rain tires. And I thought, hell yeah, dude, you're about to win your first day of May Superbike race. You know, I didn't know he was a lap down. He had come in and put rain tires on and rolled out. And yeah. I was like pumped for the guy. I'm like, if I finish, I don't care where I finish. I'm just going to ride around. I'm going to finish this race so I can tell them they're dicks. <laughs> Corey, what, 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 what event or what race you covered that was like, I never fucking ever want to cover that again. Like it, it because I, again, I, I know you were there too. There were just very, yeah, I, discussion. I, I would have to say it was that race. It was that whole weekend was a miserable experience from start to finish, but I'll never forget coming back into the paddock. You know, cause you try to come back a couple laps early to catch the podium. And then you hear, or, you know, you hear that Josh is still out there and he's still on slicks and you're like, I'm standing on level ground that is ankle deep in water. What in the <laughs> world is this guy doing out there? And then he's on slicks and you just, he's coming by. It looks like he's on a jet ski going into turn one. He's got a roost kicking out. He's only doing like 10 miles an hour, but there's so much freaking water. And I mean, my gear was just wet. My lenses got wet. That I think my soul got wet that weekend. It was terrible. That, that was a weekend that I, I can relate to again, just being, you know what? I, I'm, probably going to get sick there's so much water consumed in my cameras and everything that i'm like uh, you know no pun intended it's a wash i'm just i just want to go home and just go to a dry place but the one thing that shocked me was out in utah i think it was 2012 where i think it snowed rained went from gray cold to sunny warm you know in one day and that's the one one session that i'm like i was never ever prepared for this what the hell you know as far as i remember that yeah Snow and it, hail in the morning and yeah. then it was like 100 degrees in the afternoon yeah and then you know kind of to fast forward I, I i did uh i covered pike's peak recently and never knew you had to be into like mountaineering you know to <laughs> to survive that and going up to you know fourteen thousand feet where it's cold you're in winter gear and all of a sudden as you're traveling down you're taking your layers off because it's getting warmer and i remember in, the base camp being uh, like 102 and i'm like this is not making sense and the body wasn't just quite right so that's a those are those are kind of some horror stories and i will feel like there was that weekend at, at you, you were talking about miller right yeah so, yeah i seem to remember a, a weekend at miller you probably wish you could forget too <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe 2014 was it <laughs> no, no. I, it wasn't yeah it, it was, was the superbike shootout superbike shootout so that was uh yeah was that 2014 yeah mr scooter <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I Corey, did you hear this story Oh no! I was there. He was. He had my lens. He used my lens as the uh, shovel to dig the scooter out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, did, so, I, did you ever get to see the pictures and video of it? Yeah, because Brian J was right next to me. He shot the whole yeah, thing. <laughs> so, and, and so, did, wait, did you hear about the contract? <laughs> that's well, that the best contract. Part. That that's was the, the best part. Is that now? Here, here's, here's again, again, being the most unluckiest man in the paddock. Not Unlucky. once, but twice, I ate shit on a scooter, 30 miles an hour, in silt, trying to cover the Superbike shootout with all video and photography, lenses. And the second time I hit, that's when I got my TV recognition and I got my photos because as Cameron Bobier's low siding, you see smoke over here, but then in the right side of the screen, you see smoke and silt from me and lenses just popping, just this in the air, just man. Nobody gives a flying shit if I'm okay. They're oh, yeah. just yeah. fucking laughing. And I mean, as I'm eventually wobbling back with a dusty scooter, you know, broken camera gear, I'm trying to make Park Farm A and everything. And everyone's just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, what? You know, and, and I'm just covered in dust, just looking like an idiot. And fast forward. I think it was, yeah, I think it was Road America where I was presented with a contract, unbeknownst to me, through Ron, Ron. and Keith. 
And oh, Josh was a part of this. Josh was a I part of this. I got and to see it. I got to see it. It was beautiful. I, I sat down and I tried to play it, you know, like, listen, I didn't need shit, don't want to be on the job and be a liability. So I just played it, you know, like nothing ever happened, pretty much squash. I never want to talk about it until this contract. And they all sat me down. And it was pretty graphic because they had me wearing an oversized, like, helmet. You know, I, I had to wear an oversized helmet, you know, like, to, to, like, like a soft dome kind of shafting helmet. Uh, I had it, and all these pictures of me just eating just dirt face first, and I've never been more embarrassed in in a in a work setting. And I mean, they had me for about a good five minutes. It, until it, they was, called an bullshit. it was an addendum to the contract that he was supposed to sign. Yeah, and and it talked about like, hey buddy, it, oh okay, you come ride your bike down here, and it talked about. Um, how he had to go to like an approved riding school before yeah. he was allowed to get to get like inside get special liability insurance and stuff before he could ride Yamaha scooters again. But oh, it was yeah. and and here's the reason he sat yeah. there and looked at it. He sat there looking at it like because you were so scared, Josh. You have no this, idea. He was this, so is mad. this real? Is this real? I don't know what this is. And so we're all like twisting inside about to die. <laughs> he was so nervous. After he did that, he just nonstop talk. He's like, man, I'm in so much trouble. I'm in so much trouble. I think they're going to do something. And then he shows up with this contract, and he was just shitting bricks. It was the best. I, I, and that's the thing is, you know, <laughs> right around that time I ate shit, I was, you know, in, in, in the next two to three months, I was going to be a new dad. So I'm like, I don't need to F this job up. Yeah, you're fine. I drive and like, yeah, that's all I was like, I'm shit can. I am over before it even started. And... Thank God it was a joke because, I mean, they had me. They had me for a good, solid five to ten minutes. And then after that, I just hated everybody and just knew that Josh was involved and I hated him even more. So. I'm talking to Brian. So Yeah, you don't have to like him either. Yeah, yeah. Let the hate start at a young age. Okay, he said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, on that note, because you got your son there, what, what kind of legacy do you want to leave for, for Hawk? What do you want him dad? to? First, but look at that hair. I want to find out who his daddy is first. <laughs> <laughs> where, got... where he is. Where he is is right. Exactly. That's in New Jersey. Exactly. In Jersey. I'm in Jersey. <laughs> Just where your dad wants me to be in the opposite coast, away from him. I want to be... I... I'm, I'm... Talk to me off and off and put them back on and I know So, hey, whoa, 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 you're going to hurt yourself doing that. Go put your cones up and race around your cones. So, so Josh. I, Sorry, you know, uh, you were asking about legacy you know, and. Yeah, what do you, what do you, what I, do you envision, I just, you know? I just pray that I could be half of what my dad is. Yeah. Seriously, man, I got an incredible father, and he he didn't know a lot about motorcycles and motorcycle racing, but he never discouraged me. He didn't exactly push me or encourage me, and either he just kind of let me. He goes, man, if this is what you want to try to do, okay, and I'll help you if I can, and he did in the ways that he could. But he he was kind of odd because he was so afraid of getting in the way that he, you know, you got all these moto dads that want to get involved. My dad stood back and was like, I don't know what I'm doing. You're doing great, son, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But but I think, let me just say that I've done something right in my career because I look at how many people are out of racing. <laughs> look at the little turd. How many people are, are, are out of racing? How many people can't get jobs? How much money there is not in racing? And my reputation, my family, Yamaha, and all these other sponsors that want to get together with us for one event to do Daytona. <laughs> oh, he clipped it. <laughs> He's got to do push-ups. You know, yeah, the, the guys that would, you know, to be able to do that, I must have done something right. I must have treated people in a good way. And... That is that is on my dad. It's 100% my family, my mother and my father, really. And I hope that I can I can teach him in the in this new world where social skills are so much different that I can teach him to have some of the things I have because I recognize 
Hey, hey, buddy. You got dry clothes on, and I got a computer. Please don't splash anymore. <laughs> Please. <laughs> He's and at this, the defiant why stage. And this why? is this is what Look I wanted. Step. I wanted the yeah. realness. I wanted to see the Josh Hayes at ah, Go ride your bike. Because, dude, don't do it. I now we we're we're, we're going to let you off the hook soon, so you can yeah. enjoy family yeah. time. No, but it's I'm, fine. It's fine. So uh, wanna... anyway, uh, I was I I was trying to say, I think. I lost it now. Now you lost it. I hope, I hope I can teach him all those good skills. And I recognize that I'm, I'm really lucky, especially because I'm around all these young guys so much, right? All these young racers right now. My network is huge, right? As most people who get to a, a, a certain level in life, they get these huge networks. And how many close friends that you have is typically family and a few people. My my or still have lifelong friends and I have more than most people that I could call for anything in this world like I, I I'm so lucky that I have that and I hope that I can pass that along and that he can build and cultivate relationships and and be able to pick good character um to have those relationships with too and that's that's probably what I care about more than much of anything else that he does in his life. Excellent. And Josh, thank you again. Uh, Corey, I'm going to keep you online because I'm still, I, I got to cover a little bit more for our interview as well. But Josh. Yeah. Oh, I can't hear and make fun of that shit too? Yeah, I mean, oh, hell, I if wish you, want, you could, man. Well, then, then, then good, good. Stay on board. I just didn't know if you had uh, you know, obligation. I'll let you know if I got to go. I'll let you, I'll All right, let you. cool. Well, well, you, know, you just got to have interruptions from the little guy. That, I'm, hey, the, I'm the one who's backing up against a hard deck here, so. Yeah, you, well, that's all. Mute me if you need to. You got it. So, so Corey, you know, on that transition, you know, how did you have your parents? You know, because here's the thing: is I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that you kind of tucked it under the rug that yeah, you know, I was a uh, part of a rocket factory. You, you, you downplay that, and to me, that is something that is just like. Wow, uh, you know, just kind of mind blowing that you've got that level of intelligence and done this, isn't this? Mm. Have your parents pushed you in certain directions, or have they been encouraging about what you do professionally? No. And and then the two part is is how do you go about parenting with your children? You know, are you trying to give them a little bit more fine tuning and focus, or you know, how, how do you go about things? You know, as it translate to you. Well, we, I got all three of my kids here. If you want to ask them, they'll probably, I'm sure, be very <laughs> candid with you and how I am as a parent. Um, I, you know, to go, to go back to your first question with my parents, you know, they've, they've completely supported everything I've done, you know, in the first part of my career being in aerospace. You know, that, that was more of me probably following suit and direction. You know, I was raised a certain way. Um, you know, there were expectation markers, you know, by this age, you go to college and by this age, you do these things and then you should have a job and you should do this. And so I kind of followed that to the T. And of course, they're very supportive of it. I was more along the lines following in the same footsteps as my father, you know, when he got out of the Marine Corps joining aerospace. In fact, I was working for the same company he had, he had worked for uh, prior. And when the layoffs happened, when we stopped doing you know flying the space shuttle and budgets were going down and everything was starting kind of tanking and i came into you know started falling back on photography my parents completely supported that as well you know they're just more along the lines of you know if this is what you want to do and this is what you can do then you know you follow your talents and gifts now i'm not saying i i have any talent or gift for it it's just kind of what i'm doing hammering away at it you know i've got my hammers everything's a nail um so you know, and then when it comes to my kids, I just, you know, I wish I kind of had the network like Josh has, but, you know, the whole point is, is you just try to take the best parts of your parents, incorporate them into your experiences, and then see how it works into this new generation, because you guys both have young kids, and your kids are growing up in an age that's completely different than even my kids, who are even technically in the same generation. Yeah. And, you know, They've never not had the internet. They've never not had a smartphone. They've never not had all these great technical advances. So the best you can do is just still try to teach them on the personable side of things. It's like, look, you got to look up from your phone. You've got to interact with people, make eye contact, and establish physical human relationships. So, 
Now, I got to unmute Josh because this is the, 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 the perfect kind of segue because I have always grown up with a foundation or uh, uh, an infatuation for speed and aerodynamics and just aviation. You know, Corey, you worked the Rocket Factory. You've, you've got that, that, that background. Now, Josh... In our talking offline, you've always been a, a big a big fan of just aeronautics and stuff. What would you say uh, if you weren't on a motorcycle, you'd be uh, maybe uh, some type of airplane pilot, jet pilot, some type of Chuck Yeager kind of guy? I wanted to be, and that didn't work out, so that's why I ended up a motorcycle racer. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, the the weird thing is like, so my grandfather was a was a air force and army pilot he flew fixed wing in the air force and then he was he flew helicopters in the army and and it was funny because when he was getting close to the end of his time he was living up in the north georgia mountains and i went to visiting and he said hey have you ever seen the movie we were soldiers with mel gibson i go yeah of course love it maybe he goes i flew into that lz i was one of the helicopter pilots that flew into that lz i was like oh wow that's pretty cool you know and he, he talked about it and wanted to watch the movie and this and that. And he never really talked about any of that stuff to my mom and stuff, you know. But um, he actually, when I was very, very young, elementary school, told me that when, when I knew I wanted to be a pilot. I lived next to an Air National Guard base. I watched F-4 Phantoms fly in and out weekly. That's what I wanted to do. And... He told me they'll never take you. I already had glasses in the fourth grade. My teeth were not good. And from his, the protocol back in Vietnam air stuff was if you didn't have perfect eyesight, you didn't have teeth, you couldn't get into the flight program. So, I mean, I, I, I got to be honest, my, my vision all the way throughout high school was pretty narrow being in South Mississippi. There just wasn't much to see outside of that. I never traveled much. So that kind of blew school for me because I kind of quit trying. <laughs> you know, I really just didn't put in much effort. So I scraped through high school at the bare minimum. And uh, it's funny, I was in advanced classes making bare minimum grades. I never brought a book home in high school. Never. Yeah. So um, There's I skimmed a by. joke in this somewhere. I know. And I, I got <laughs> through school and, you know, then I got into racing and moved on to those things and then flying was long gone. The one thing that was pretty cool was, you know, later in my career. And as I, as is when Melissa and I met, I think the first Christmas we were together, I got her a custom painted Arai helmet for her to race with. And she was pretty pumped on it. Yeah. And then she got for my birthday, probably the best birthday present I've ever gotten. Have you ever heard of that air combat USA? Mm-hmm. Corey, they fly oh, out of yeah. Fullerton. Oh, yeah. So I got to go up there and go up in an extra 300 t twice, and I got to fly the thing and, like, do a dogfight with this guy. It was pretty damn cool. Loved That's it. That's awesome. So then through another friend, this this guy, uh, Bernie Willis, uh, who had taken Greg White up in an F-16 and was a huge motorcycle racing fan, we became really good friends, and I loved talking to him all the time because, you know, fighter pilot. And that. I mean, we'd pass along each other books and I'd tell him what was going on at the races, and we stayed real close. He ended up getting Melissa and I up both in F-16s, and we got to actually go fly side by side, dogfight each other, like the whole shebang. And to have my friend in the front seat, it couldn't have been better, like, we almost, we almost ruined the ride right off the bat because we took off off the runway, got up to 500 feet, 550 knots, pulled vertical up to 9,000 feet and rolled out. And with the centerline fuel tank, you were limited on the number of Gs to like 7.5. And he he had thought, oh, it'll be about a 4 or 5 G pull that will pull up north. And he, he hadn't been in the U.S. planes. He'd been flying Dutch aircraft, training them. And the U.S. plane had a, a bigger intake, a bigger engine, a Pratt & Whitney instead of a uh, – or no, it had a GE instead of a Pratt & Whitney and this other cool stuff. So anyway, almost over G'd the plane. We broke all the static dischargers off the back of the wings in the first pull in the aircraft. <laughs> and, like, and so it was like I got the ride of a lifetime. It was fantastic. We did simulated bombing runs. We did some dogfighting. We got to do a lot of cool stuff. Um, and then another time I was in Vegas and actually went and saw uh, – aerobatic guy he said oh yeah i'll take you for an aerobatic ride an extra 300 again i'm like yes 
So I'm talking to him about, I've been up in an F-16, and he goes, ah, fighter pilots, they don't like to be upside down that much. You know, he was kind of making fun, taking digs out. Yeah. And so we go out, and he does, you know, some lubes and some aileron rolls, and he does a few things, and he goes, all right, you know, this, that. And so he goes, we're going to go check out the Grand Canyon. So I got on the radio, and go, man, I've seen the Grand Canyon, dude, but, like, when you do this by yourself, it's a little more violent than that, right? Like, he goes, yeah, most people don't like getting shaken up like that. I said, dude, will you show me some shit? He goes, all right, bro, you asked for it. Let's go back out to the area. So we turned around and cruised back out. And I got the ride from there. You know, we went up and stalled the thing and tail slid it, flipped it end over end about three times on the way down. And, wow. man, the, the one thing that kind of killed me, ruined me for the rest of the day, the last thing he did was he flipped it upside down and did the, like a quarter of an outside loop where it tries to throw you out the canopy. And it filled my head full of blood, and I had a headache for like two days after that. <laughs> so oh, man. I didn't throw up, but it, it did that. And then I got to go up one more time and ride with the blue angels so i mean i've gotten to do more cool things in my life than anybody deserves and i got to experience these amazing things the funny thing was melissa had zero interest she was terrified of little airplanes she doesn't like airliners that much and the thought of the f-16 was terrifying to her but she was like i can't exactly say no they don't let people do this very often so Fortunately, those guys were so awesome to work with. We had so much fun. They took us into a hangar and practiced egress training. They chatted with us, and, like, they were our buddies. So we just had a great time. Lots of Top Gun quotes and references and things like that. So we got to do all this fun stuff. So she was nervous. Then we go out. We get in the plane. Her plane, the navigational platform, broke down on her plane. And, like, four 20-year-old kids with the manuals are standing next to it with the canopy cracked open. <laughs> And she's looking out the window, and these kids are working on it. She's like, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? So anyway, they decided to send her up, and just they had to stay within sight of us. So we take off and do our thing, go out, do all that stuff. And when we came back and landed, Melissa, who had been nervous and damn near scared, too scared to go do it, was like, shit, I have my bachelor's degree. Like, and they're accepting people – like a year older than me right now is to cut off and they want more women. Like she was, she was seriously contemplating taking off, going to OCS and trying to do it. And, That's interesting. Wow. And, and she just kind of was a little wishy-washy on it till time ran out. Now, now Corey, you've, I mean, I can't believe when you were telling me, that. yeah, I used to jump out of planes. Now, now go tell me about your experiences. No, oh, nothing, nothing nearly as exciting as that. I, I've, I've experienced, you know, you know, rolling over what Josh was talking about, where you do that kind of like a quarter outside loop, because we have been, uh, we had, I forget the plane what it was, but it was a old like World War II sliding canopy. Yeah. And he used to, <laughs> land, yeah, he used to land at our drop zone to just refuel on his way around South Carolina, and sure enough, you know, one day we talked him into. You know, hey, can you fit about two or three of us in there? Because in skydiving, there's no seats, and we just pack into whatever's flying. And he's like, yeah, cool. So he packed a bunch of us in. We get up to about 10,000 feet, and then he just rolls it upside down and just drops us out. <laughs> and that, that was just a thrill. Awesome. Um, you know, I've, I got hit by the airplane I've jumped out of, which was interesting. Um, I've had the plane that I jumped out of past me in free fall. So I don't know if you guys remember that. We're all the same age. So you remember that Wesley Snipes movie? Was it? Uh, uh, ah, dang it. I wish I could remember the name of it. Vertical Limit or something like that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, where they were doing a skydive and the plane passes them in free fall. And yeah. I had that. And that is absolutely insane. Um, in that same plane, we used to do uh, like the Vomit Comet before they started using the oh, Vomit Comet. Yeah. So we, it's built for nine people. Sure parabolic arcs yeah so it was you know it's a built for nine people but when you've only got three people and no seats he'd start doing these parabolas and we'd all just float up and oh and actually, to bring it home to you brian that was over at crosky's right next to you nope. that was yeah. outside of newark nope. uh good old newark well uh, listen gentlemen i i gotta say i i didn't expect this this much content and to keep you guys on as long but this this is fun and uh you know i do i do appreciate you guys making the time to uh to to talk um but uh you know i'm gonna leave it open do you guys have any parting words before we uh we we, we end this 
I'm good. Man. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Brian. The displeasure is all mine. Yes, of course. Thank you. I, you know, I knew it was going to be like one last dig. One last yeah. dig. When he doesn't have to be do this, I'm like, do what? Do I owe this displeasure? <laughs> it always has to end on this note. It wouldn't be. The, it wouldn't be anything else. Well, guys, thank you again. Um, stay tuned for some more uh, shows. But uh, again, thank you, Josh Hayes. Thank you, Corey Coulter, for uh, joining me. No problem. Thanks, Brian.